the sun's shining, the birds are chirping, I'm sitting on the bench, and all of a sudden I hear, don't move. And I open up my eyes and there's a gun right in my nose. He looks down at me and he asks me, so how long have you been an associate of the Gambino family? So I looked up at him and I said, since birth. What's up, guys? Today's guest is Anthony Ruggiano Jr. You've probably seen him on the Get Gotti documentary out right now on Netflix. Anthony was born into the Gambino crime family. His father was a Gambino soldier. He himself was an associate of the mob from a young age. He is from Brooklyn, New York. He was involved in hijackings, stolen merchandise, drug dealing, murders. He was close associates with John Gotti during the 1980s. He knew Sammy the Bull. He was around that whole clique. He went in and out of prison. In 2005, he was arrested on federal RICO and murder charges. He ended up cooperating, went into witness protection. Years later, he is out. He's a free man. He is crime free. He has a tremendous podcast called Reform Gangsters. Go subscribe to it on YouTube and check out his documentary, Get Gotti, number one on Netflix. He is by far the most well-connected and mob-entrenched guest that we have had on the show. And for a bonus episode with some wild stuff, go over to patreon.com slash the connect show. Without further ado, I give you an amazing episode with Anthony Ruggiano Jr. right here on The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. And we walked in and when we walked in, Frankie walked in ahead of me and I heard the door lock behind me. And Tony grabbed his hand and said, wait, I want to talk to you. And I just kept on walking. And when I walked, I gave the nod to Dominic. And Dominic took the pistol out and went to the back and shot. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think. I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. And then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, a shank, it's like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. Anthony, thank you so much for coming out here, man. You're welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure. Go check out his channel on YouTube. Go watch Get Gotti on Netflix. It was tremendous. You were a star in thank it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about your story uh, for the most most of the episode, but just referencing that doc, I mean, I knew a lot about Gotti before, but then after watching it, you know, no disrespect to the dead, but I was like, this guy really just talked his way into a life sentence and effectively bringing down the last real generation of wise guys. What is his legacy now? Now that we've seen him just unnecessarily talking on a wire about all these bodies that, that effectively took him down mm. and all his cohorts, what is his legacy now with wise guys? Well, his legacy now in the street is that he, he ruined the mob. He brought the mob down. I mean, he played a part in it. I mean, I can only tell you how I feel. He played upon it, but I mean, the Rico statue was the beginning of the end of the mob. As far as he goes, he played a major role in it. And he just thought, first of all, he thought he was above the law. He thought the public loved him. He really believed that the worst he could ever get was a hung jury. And he said that because he said, the public loves me. And the apartment that he spoke in, I was in that apartment. That apartment was on top of the Ravenite. This fellow named Mike and his wife owned it. They must have lived there a hundred years. Mm. Mike passed away. And I just believe that he thought it would be okay because first of all, they didn't even know he was up there until a confidential informant mm -hmm. told him. And he probably thought who in the Ravenite was a confidential informant. Mm -hmm. All of us were in the Ravenite. Do we know who that confidential never, informant was? Never, never. People speculate. Mm -hmm. I have no idea who it is. Nobody, the name never was released. Nobody knows. I mean, he's talking was. about bodies from the past right. that he already moved on right. from. They right. didn't have anything on him. No, they had nothing. And and the, yeah, the tapes, and you know, there was one section of the tape where he made a comment and they put it together with an old surveillance tape. That's, mm -hmm. And that started the whole ball. And they actually, you know, it was funny too about what Get Gotti, what they brought out, which people, some people are missing. The FBI went to the media to talk about the Castellano killing, and they started the conversation talking. If you saw Get Gotti, you know there was a part in Get Gotti where they called it, they they nudged it, or they did something to with 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 with, with one of the news stations to start talking about stuff. And then John picked up on, oh, did you hear? Did you see right. the news the other night? They talked about mm -hmm. Paul, and that started the ball rolling. Right. So, oh, so they intentionally planted that in, in the, the news media because they knew his ego. They exactly. knew that was going to get him opening exactly. his mouth. Exactly, and that and it worked. 
So, because he, you know, we had Sal Polisi on the show before, yes. and he dealt a lot with John when John was younger, like in the right. 70s. Yeah. And he said the way that John committed hits and made money, he was a really smart dude when mm -hmm. it came to crime. But it sounds like he was just his ego after winning the first two cases yeah. against him. It was just right. out of control. He was he was an emperor that had just gone <laughs> without his clothes. You know, like they were egomaniacs. I mean, he was my father, too, was an egomaniac. I think people in that life that have these big personalities and that are well known and have a lot of power, their ego goes to the head. I mean, like literally, listen, I was with John and I talked about this before. I had Tony Lee, my father's partner, mm. who was a wise guy, had a lunch appointment with him in Brooklyn. So I drove him to the lunch appointment. I walk into this restaurant. It's crowded. He's sitting at a table with Joe Watts, who was a killer. Mm -hmm. um, he was German, but he was like, John loved him. Um, and they're sitting there. And he's looking around, John, and he says, look, the public loves me. They'll never, the, we start talking about trials. Mm -hmm. He goes, they'll never convict me. The worst I'll get is a hung jury. And before we left, two, a couple walked up to him and asked him for his autograph. And the guy signed his autograph. <laughs> now, here's a mob boss signing an autograph. You know, like Tony Lee is an old timer. He didn't say nothing at the table, of course, because John's the boss. But when we got in the car, like, he was not happy. Like, right. I thought, what is this guy kidding? How the fuck did he right. sign a autograph? I, you know, like, it, it was just unheard of. Right, because it's supposed to be a secret. Right. Cosa Nostra, our thing. This is a secret society, and he's making it part of pop culture. Right. And, yeah, you were saying, too, like, he was partying in Studio 54. Oh, yeah. Oh, Didn't yeah. Brooke Shields want yeah, his so, number? You know, he was out in regimes every night. I mean, I used to go to Club A with him, right? And all the stars used to go to yeah. Club A. And one night, Brooke Shields walked up to him, said goodnight to him, and stuck her finger, his hand, her hand in his pocket. But I didn't know what was going on. When we walked out, he went in his pocket. He took out the phone number. I said, what's that? He goes, did she put her number in my pocket? And he ripped it up. I said, what did you do? What are you ripping it up for? He goes, she's my daughter's age. I said, you should have gave me the number. What are you kidding me? He goes, get right. out of here. But, you know, but... So we would go to Pastels. So there was this other club in Brooklyn that the Genovese family owned, this captain with the Genovese family that was friends with John owned it. And we would go to this, it was called Pastels. And we would go there. And, and when you walked in, all the way in the back was the VIP room, but you could see into the VIP room. Mm. And all the girls in, would be looking, staring, looking to see where he was sitting. So one night we were in there and there was a whole bunch of us, me, Tony Lee, this guy, Bobby the Jew, but he wasn't Jewish. He was Italian. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was his Italian nickname. Italian yeah, thing yeah. to call that somebody. Was, like, maybe because he was cheap. I don't know. But then right. I wanted him. He was just, I don't know why. He, I tell you the truth. I really don't know why they gave. That's what they used to call him. But there was a whole bunch of us. And, you know, I'm, I'm there and I'm walking out and I'm like grabbing girls. And I'm going, come on, you want to come to the table? And they're all coming and I'm bringing girls over to the table. Finally, I sit down and I was sit actually sitting next to him at the time. And he like leaned over and he goes, there's enough girls at the table. Stop bringing them over here. I said, all right, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So he really was like kind of how political dictators, uh, it's so obvious to the outside world that their regimes are about to fall, mm -hmm. but they become so intoxicated by their power and, it, and their underlings, you, yeah. your father, whoever was working for him, nobody spoke up. Nobody was like, no. John, you're going to go down. Like yeah. you're going to, you're going to take us all down with you. It's kind of sounds like, sounds like that's how it all. Yeah, no, unraveled. nobody, no, he, he had, he made it a rule. He made people report. Like he put it on, like his thing was, you want to be in this life? You cannot hide in your house. You got to be out. You got to be out. Just yeah. because we're under surveillance, you're going to come out. You're yeah, going right. to be out. There's no hiding in the basements. There's no hiding in your house. Like, he put it in their face. Like, he made it a rule. Like, guys like Tommy Gambino, Carl Gambino's son, he made him come to the Ravenite. Yeah. He made captains come to the Ravenite to meet with him. He made them mm -hmm. because he was a gangster and he yeah. wanted you in the street. Like, yeah. you had a, he was a hoodlum. You ain't staying in your house. To win. You're not a businessman. You're going to be out. You're mm -hmm. going to come see me. I don't give a f if the FBI take your picture. It yeah. doesn't matter. And that's how they got everybody's picture. Right. We, you know, even me, I, I mean, I, how, like, every time I got, after he became the boss, I got, I got arrested a few times. So, so, not in, not right away. So he got when after he became the boss in um the first time I had gotten arrested after he became the boss was in eighty nine. 
I got arrested in Jamaica, Queens, in a, in a, and now we had a number off. It's a pilot hearing, which is the lotto. If people don't know what I'm talking about. They raided the office. They, they kicked the door in. It was a whole big thing. Um, the front page of the Daily News, John Gotti, John Gotti. He had nothing to do with it. Yeah. He had nothing right. to do with it at all. Yeah. And he's a ball buster now, John Gotti. Right? So now I get out on bail and I go see him and he goes, hey, we made $14 million last year. Where's my where's my end? I said, oh, you want to, I'm going to go to jail. You want to break my balls? Yeah. You know, because, because we hung around him and that's the price we paid. Yeah. And then I went, and then I got the most time. I went to the worst prisons because I was Fat Andy's son, and we were affiliated with him. Yeah, that's how we suffered the consequences of his, you know, his orbit. Exactly. So let's go back to the beginning. So mm. what we're talking about is the Gambinos, most right. powerful of the five families in New York at uh, one time. Yes, at one time, uh, East New York is mm. where it really was birthed in New right. York City. Your father, you were born into this life. Yes. Your father. Uh, was Fat Andy, mm -hmm. started off small time robbing uh, car games. <laughs> car games. Car yeah. games, you know, illegal neighborhood car games back yeah. in the 50s, right. right after the war. Right. And uh, he became a button man mm -hmm. for, I'm sorry, who was his boss? Albert Anastasia. Okay, Albert Anastasia, uh, the boss of the Gambinos at the time, or well, was it a wasn't captain? the Gambino family at the time, it was the Mangano family. Okay. Albert Anastasia was the boss before Carl Gambino. Okay. And actually, the guy that proposed my father, Charlie Waggins, Charlie Fatico, is the same wise guy that proposed John Gotti. Uh, they got made by the same guy in East New York. So Charlie was a, a made member of the Mangano family in East New York. And when my father was stealing, robbing the poker games, he robbed one of Charlie's games. Oh. So there was this other guy named Albert Mayoni. He was Happy Mayoni's brother. Happy Mayoni was a member of Murder Incorporated. He got the electric chair when he was it, with, with, uh, with, uh, with Lepke and all of them guys in the Dasher. Um, so he told, Charlie asked him if he knew this kid Andy, and he said, yeah, he's Liberty's kid brother. Now, Liberty was my older, my father's older brother, my uncle Frank, but his nickname was Liberty. He goes, he's Liberty's brother. He says, you think you could uh, get the money back from him? And... Albert told Charlie, there's only two things you could do with this kid. Either you could kill him or give him a job. He ain't giving you back the money. It's probably gone. So Charlie told Albert to bring my father to him. And that was the beginning. And Charlie and Albert brought my father to Charlie. Charlie liked him. He made my father start driving him around. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my father getting introduced to that crime family. And he got straightened out. Yeah. Well, he got, he started hanging out with Charlie and then, uh, he told the story that he told me is one day he was in the bar with Charlie and Charlie took him outside and he was only a kid. He was only probably at that time, maybe 24 years old. And Charlie asked him, if we ask you to clip somebody, are you okay with that without asking any questions? And my father said, yeah. And then about two or three months later, that's when he did his first hit for, for that family. Mm -hmm. He, you know, I, it's not funny, but he told me he was still living home with his mother. He was still living with my grandmother. Right. He said, and Charlie picked him up at, at my grandmother's house, and there was a guy in the car with Charlie, and he got in the back seat, and Charlie's brother, Danny, who was also a wise guy, was in a, a car behind him, and he said they pulled out, and they drove a ways away from grandma's house. He goes, and then I whispered in the guy's ear, and I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, what do you mean you whispered in the guy's ear? He went, I whispered in his ear. And he was only a kid. He was 24. And that was the beginning. Then he did a couple of other things. And the books were closed in 1953. But they made him a special case because of the the work he did. They call it work. And uh, they passed his name around. And um, a member of the Genovese family, Tony the Sheik, put, up a, put a beef in to stop my father from getting made because my father had robbed one of his poker games wow. when he was a kid. So they had to sit down in Manhattan with... Uh, Tony the Sheik, um, who was in the Genovese family at the time, and uh, a couple of other guys in Albert Anastasia, who was the boss of that family. Charlie was there, and this guy, Tommy Rava, who was the captain, Charlie's captain. And they had to sit down in Manhattan. My father had to sit at another table. He told me because he wasn't actually a made member mm -hmm. yet, but he could hear everything that they were saying. And Tony the Sheik was going... This kid's an animal. He has no respect. And you're going to straighten him out. And he was putting up this beef with and out. And he said nobody was talking. And after he was done, 
Albert Anastasia, who they called the high executioner, if you know about Albert Anastasia, he leaned in and he says to Tony the Sheik, he goes, well, who do you want me to straighten out? Priests? Right. And that was the end of the conversation. Right. And then my father got straightened out. And it's funny because years later, Tony the Sheik owned a restaurant called Don Pep's. It's still open. It's on Leffitt's Boulevard in Ozone Park. Oh my goodness. It's great food if anybody wants yeah. to go there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah shout like really out. Great food. Free plug. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is North America's biggest daily fantasy sport. Sports platform. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you and the numbers. You're not battling thousands of other players, sharks, and pros. I am a complete layperson when it comes to sports gambling, but I love prize picks because they make it idiot proof. I'm telling you, it's Super Bowl time, you guys. Basketball is in full swing. There's money to be made. Prize picks is so simple. I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy game plan, and enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. I'm watching way more sports and I'm having more fun doing it. And I'm making more money. I'm like coming up off this thing. Go to prizepix.com slash connect and use code connect for a first deposit match up to $100. Let me repeat that for all you nincompoops out there. It's prizepix.com slash C-O-N-N-E-C-T and use that code connect for a first deposit match up to $100. Don't be a Judd Rule this Super Bowl season. Head over to Prize Picks right now and come the f up. Thank you, Prize Picks, for sponsoring us. So anyway, um, and the Genovese family, like Tony the Sheik owned it. He was a captain, mm -hmm. and then he, this guy uh, Cyril Perone, who was a another captain, he inherited it, and now another wise guy named Mike, he he inherited it. Mm -hmm. So the Genovese family always owned this restaurant, and we start one, and we went there, and we would go there, and Tony the Sheik would be there. And he would come over and he would like be my father's best friend. Right. And then he'd walk away and my father would go, yeah, now he's my best friend. When I was a kid, he wanted to have me killed. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a lot of Ooh. and and really false smiles and pretenses in the mafia life. Because, yeah. you know, uh, your father, I believe, had dinner with the same guy that he clipped three days before. Yeah. Or would have dinner, be having yeah. dinner at yeah. the table with a guy, a maid member, who they knew yeah, was, going. was going away, but they you're able to smile and put on pretenses. It's uh it's a very creepy thing. But I, I want to talk about your father because he had a lot of hustles. You know, yeah. I think it's a really big misconception when you know you see clickbait on all these YouTube videos, mafia hitman. But hitman's not even a job. No. You don't really even get paid to do hits no. in the mafia. It's uh, it's handled by people that are employed. That's mm. work. That's just what you do. You're on payroll and the boss says, go push a button on a guy. That's what you go do. Mm. But you're not killing enough people. In other words, your father had to earn. Just because you might go clip a guy every now and then, mm. you still have to earn. Like what were some of his, when he got straightened out, when he became a made man, what were some of his rackets? Well, it's funny because when he first got straightened out, he was broke. He was only a kid. So he got straightened out when he was 26. Now he was married. He married my mother who was 19 at the time. And they and I was actually born the same year in 53, the same year he got made. And he actually worked as a doorman at a dice game for $20 a night, like as a made member. Oh my God. And he would tell me he would work at the crap game, he would get paid $20. He would go home. He would give my mother the $20 because she had me. She had to buy milk and diapers, mm -hmm. whatever. And then him and Tony Lee, his partner, would go out and hustle. And they were doing stick-ups. They were doing whatever they could do to get money. They didn't have a crew yet. He had no crew yet. Right. So he was just, he, he said on Christmas Eve, they would go stick up toy stores. Like, they were broke. We lived in a house next to the train out. Like, we mm -hmm. lived in an apartment that right outside the window was the train out on Labonia right. Avenue in East New York. Like, you know, we had no money. Um, and then what happened was there was a crew of kids in East New York and John was running around in East New York at the time. John got it. They were all teenagers and uh, they were doing some bad stuff. They were breaking into uh, jukeboxes and stealing nickels and stuff. Mm -hmm. And one guy was named Nicky Carraza, who later became the acting boss. And this whole crew and uh, Tony Lee's brother, my father asked Tony Lee's brother, Mikey Gal, who later became a wise guy, who these kids were. And he said, they're lefty, lefty Carraza's kids. 
And my father knew Lefty and his brother Cowboy, they did time together, and he brought them to my father. And then my father put them all to work. And he started out with um, horse rooms. That's how he started making his money. Originally, he opened it. Back then, they used to call them horse rooms. And you would walk in, and they'd have a big blackboard on the wall, like you see in the movies. Yeah. And there'd be guys on phones. And the, and uh, they would they opened started with horse rooms. And they were booking horses uh, from all over the country. And that's how he started making money with these horse rooms. That was the beginning. And he right. started making money. And then, then they started doing hijack. Then these guys that he started putting together this crew they started hijacking they start back then there was no casinos mm. so dice games were very big he went partners with the um lucchese family he was very very close with paul vario who was in goodfellas mm -hmm. yeah they were very very good friends paul vario his brother babe vario they they were very tight with my father and his partner and they started opening up uh dice games very big uh lucrative dice games with 300 dollars limits it was like casinos and because the mob it was a different world back then. It was yeah. um, like every, like they had dice games around the clock and every family had a slot. Like, so they broke the day up. Like, so, so you, so let's say from one in the afternoon to three was the Genovese family. So they would have a dice game in the Bronx. Right. And then at three o'clock, three 30, they closed their dice game. And then from six to nine, the Lucchese family had a dice mm. game in Canarsie, and then they would open, and then midnight to three in the morning, the Gambino family would have a dice game, and 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 they'd open. And I worked in one. Our slot when I worked in the seventies was um, our slot was one to four in the Bronx on Gun Hill Road, and what how they did it was. They have a dice game, but all the families made money. So, like, so if the, if it was the Gambino slot, they banked the game. The yeah. banker makes the most money. Yeah. The bank, they banked the game. The Lucchese family, they would Shylock the game. So if gamblers want to borrow money, they would borrow it off the Lucchese family. The Bonanno family, they write the numbers. There'd be a guy there writing numbers, which was big, you know, big. Right. A lot. And there'd be and guys are gonna win. Give me twenty dollars on one, two, three. Give me fifty dollars right. on seven, eight, nine. Give me a hundred dollars, right. you know. And, so in other words, the people, the gamblers there rolling dice yeah, they're also might want to put in they're numbers. Right, they're borrowing right. money. Then you had another crew of uh, uh with the food, you know, Sam making money with the food. So everybody made money. So that's how he started making money so with uh, hang on, this is fascinating. So the the purpose of having these slots is to basically give business to all of the families to share the turf. Right. So if a if I'm a gambler, I'm a degenerate, yeah. and I'm on Gun Hill Road in the Bronx, uh, I can't. But it's 1 p.m. I got to shoot down to Manhattan yeah. because it's the Gambino's turn. It's a Gambino yeah, slot. But, in but other words, you don't. But we they but they also had so they also had. They also had drivers and dispatches and lug. It's a it was a whole. So they had drive. They had a dispatch, like a cab dispatch, and yeah. you would call them and say, "Listen, I want to go to the dice game. I'm I'm here." We they send a driver to get you and bring you to the right. game. Then they had wow. luggers. So what a lugger is, like, let's say you you're a lugger. I have ten guys that want to shoot crap. I bring you to the game and I get fifty dollars a head. Right. Oh, and that's how you guys market it. Right. You market so now the I spots. get fifty dollars a head. I'm gonna shoot crap. I'm the lugger, but I'm shoot. so you give me I, I bring you ten guys, you give me five hundred. I'm 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 gambling. Yeah. So you know, so you had you had dispatches, you had drivers, you had luggers. It was a whole thing. It and was, it was a cartel. It was completely shared. It was almost like a, right. a union. Right. Profit sharing between the shared. five and, and so organized. And it went and it kept it went around the clock practically yeah. around the clock. And so your father for the Gambinos had action in these games. Oh yeah, they had the biggest games. Him and Paul Rivera had big games. Where were his spots? Oh, they were all over Brooklyn. The spot I first worked in was in the Bronx on Gun Hill Road. We were partner at that time. He was partners with the Genovese family. They were, back, were banking the game. My father and the Genovese family were Paulie. They were in uh, Canarsie. They were in Brooklyn, all over Brooklyn. Manhattan. Yeah. We had a game on Mott Street. We had a game. Uh, I worked the not crap game on Mott Street. I mean, they were all over the place. And, and were these mostly Italian patrons, or no, was it everybody? No, everybody. Everybody came there. I mean, we had a game. So my father had a, had a crap game. Like I said, the first one I worked what was in the Bronx. It was a three hundred dollar limit game. It was on Gun Hill Road. I was a kid. I was eighteen years old, and people would come with crazy money. And I told them one day, why don't why do we have a game all the way in the Bronx? I'm going, why don't we have a game like in Queens? He yeah. goes, 
because there's all junk dealers in the Bronx because all the guys in the Bronx with drug dealers. Selling heroin and crack. And, and they would come in. No, it was way before crack. Heroin, yeah. Heroin. And they would come in with bags full of money. Right. And all these guys, like Arnold Squatteri, Funzi, all these guys, later John actually made all, they all became main members of the Gambino film, oh. but they were all dope dealers and they would come in and lose crazy money. Right. So yeah. they could, John actually made dope dealers? Oh, when, when John got straightened out, all the guys that were selling heroin around them that were Italian, eighty percent of them all got became made members. And the, the, and John allowed them to keep selling. Well, yeah, the rules were way Damn, different. He really he, threw, yeah. took the rules yeah, and threw, threw it, it out yeah, the yeah. window. Yeah, oh, Arnold was a thanks, John. Arnold was a big heroin deal. Arnold Squatteri was a big heroin deal. His partner Funzi, a lot of guys, a lot of guys. Ed, Eddie Lino. I mean, there was a lot of guys that were big heroin dealers that, that all got straightened out. Mm -hmm. But that's how my father started rolling. He put together this crew with Nicky yeah. Carrazzo and all these guys, and they started, you know, with the hijacking and yeah. and 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 that's how it started. And then he started making big money. And so John Gotti was part of that, you know, early seventies uh, cadre of like young guys coming up that got into hijacking with, you know, some of the guys we know from Goodfellas, Tommy, uh, sorry, help me Tommy out. Tommy DeSimone. Tommy DeSimone and, and like uh, Sal. Jimmy Burke and Sal Polici. Jimmy Burke. So was, did he actually work for, did he do scores for your father? No. So what happened was after my father got straightened down in 53, when he started putting together this crew, so John was a teenager also in East New York with this, with this crew. And so there was two, so out of the younger generation, behind my father, excuse me, there was a crew. So this guy, Nicky Carrazzo, who's still alive, he's, he's a captain now, but he, he, was, he was, became my father's main guy. There was friction between him and John Gotti, like who was the toughest kid in the neighborhood. Yeah. And there was friction. And they started having personal beefs, the two of them, like fist fights. I mean, like bad beefs. If that didn't happen, John Gotti may have winded up with my father. But what happened was when they started beefing, my father sided with Nikki and John winded up going with Charlie Wagons, who originally proposed my father. Because uh -huh. my father at the time, my father and Charlie were the only two wise guys in East New York. Then my father proposed Tony Lee. And then it was Tony Lee, my father and Charlie. Uh -huh. And John went with Charlie and Nikki and his crew went with my father. Okay. And that's how I it see. started. That I was see. in the early 60s. That so, was in the so 60s. So they were in proximity, but he wasn't right. actually under your father. Right. Now, but so they you, did business together. Right. Charlie and my father always did business together. I mean, they shared loads together. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they 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 were all hijacking. Because listen, Kennedy Airport was right in Ozone Park. Mm -hmm. It was right there. It was perfect And the Lucchese for the taking. family, Paul Vario had the union. They ran Kennedy Airport. The Teamsters, they had it. Him and Frank the Wop, they ran the airport. In Ozone Park, in my neighborhood, when I was a kid, you had two prominent places. You had Aqueduct Racetrack, which back in the day, on a Saturday, it was 30,000 people in the racetrack. Now, of course, the cable and everything else, mm. nobody goes to see live racing anymore. But back in the day, it was tremendous. It's a million, million dollars worth tremendous, of races. Tremendous, tremendous. Yeah. So that was right in my neighborhood and John F and Kennedy Airport was in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So in Ozone Park, everybody worked either in Kennedy Airport or at Aqueduct Racetrack. Mm -hmm. So the airport was wide open and they were taking everything out of it, yep. taking everything out of it. And they all worked together. They all sold loads together. You yep. know, it was all, you know, everybody made money. Yeah. Your dad, your father wasn't part of the Lufthansa heist, but he was around it. You know, he knew he probably fenced some things. Yes. So what happened was off of it. The night of the heist, I was in prison when that heist took place in seventy nine. I believe I was in prison. I was in art to kill. Um, so after the heist, they actually stashed the stuff by Vinnie Sarah's house, cousin's house, mm -hmm. and they went to my father's cafe, Cafe Liberty. And they partied, they celebrated. He was waiting for them to come back. People asked me if he knew about it. I don't know if he I I, I don't know if he knew about they were gonna do it that night, but he knew to wait for them. Like they mm. might have called him later, were coming there, because he was close to them, because I was in jail at the time. And they came to Cafe Liberty and they were partying with him and celebrating. Um I got out of jail in 1980. My father had a gold and silver exchange because gold and silver was skyrocketing. Carter was the president. Mm -hmm. 
and we all know about <laughs> we all know Jimmy how Carter. That went. Yeah. We all know how that went. It was good for us, but so so yeah. You know, unfortunately for society, when the economy in the United States does bad. The mob does good. Exactly. You guys loan money because right. the interest rates are too high. Right. When inflation skyrockets, the price of gold goes up. Right. Yeah, there's a ton of ways. Right. People are miserable, so they're gambling, right. using dope. Right. So when Jimmy Carter was the president, we were making big money, even with gas, because there was gas shortages and people, gas stations were closed. We had our own gas. I mean, we just were making money over- What were the gas foot. rackets? I'm curious. Well, I mean- so Michael had the gas tax thing going, right. but we had so there was there was the, the, a gas shortage. It was mm -hmm. just, and and so we had a gas station, and we'd make the guy open up at midnight, and we'd sell gas. So you make the guy. What does that mean? <laughs> well, we, you you encourage him. So what him. happened was <laughs> we went in there. Well, I didn't go in there. My father went in there with this guy, Skinny Dom, and they the, the guy owner of the place they told them you're going to open up every night at 12 o'clock oh because there was a law that you couldn't because they were trying to ration gas ration, right and they didn't allow the, the, the gas stations were, the lines right. were crazy like you had to wait three hours for a gallon of gas right and so we they made the guy open at midnight and that's and then and then charged way right, way people more came and right. they had to pay to come and you know plus we all gassed up our cars right. you know what i mean yeah, like, right yeah, right and it was a whole big thing so that but must have been good money it was great money but the gold and silver so what happened was gold and silver skyrocketed mm -hmm. so my father opened up a, a gold and silver exchange because now when it's gold and silver skyrocketed all the drug addicts and everybody was just robbing Everybody's, everybody was getting robbed. Yeah. And they were all bringing the gold and silver to, to my father and Tony right. Lee. Because, you know, they knew wise guys owned the place. And they, yeah. so my father had one in Harlem and one in Ozone Park. Mm. And Jimmy Birkin and 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 um, and, um Vinny Asara knew my father. And they brought him, when they robbed Lutunza, they had a lot of jewelry that they put on the side. And about two years after the robbery, they brought all the jewelry to my father. And the reason why they brought my father the jewelry is, first of all, they had a good relationship with him, and they didn't want the bosses to know anymore. They didn't want to cough up any more money. Right. So they brought the jewelry to my father and Tony Lee, and they told my father and Tony Lee, fence the jewelry mm -hmm. and, you know, just don't say nothing. And my right. father would never say nothing. And my father and Tony Lee got rid of all the jewelry. Now, how... When you say fence, fencing is when you take and sell stolen goods. Right. How is he fencing them? Is he selling them legally through these pawn shops slash gold places? Or is he actually also selling them on the black market to other fencers? How does that work? Well, what happened was they had connections in, in the Diamond District. They used to call them the beards. They, they were Hasidic Jews. Hasidic Jews, right? yeah. So, and they had the diamond. They still do. They had mm -hmm. the diamond district locked up. So my father, had, and, they, and, and they're criminals. I mean, some of them are yeah, criminals. Yeah, they are. You know what For I mean? Sure. And, and so my father had good hooks with them. They did a lot of business with, with mafia. The, yeah. They were like tied in. Yeah. They, and they were, some of them were tough bastards. I mean, they were dangerous, <laughs> sure. you know, they'll yeah. kill you, you know? <laughs> And uh, so they had ins with them and they had schmelters, what they call schmelters. A schmelter is someone that melts jewelry. Right. And so they would, so they brought all the jewelry to them. And then, so, so basically a junkie rips off a gold chain in Harlem, sells it to your dad. Your dad takes it to the diamond district. They schmelt it, they down, schmelt it down and then they turn around and sell it legally. Yeah. To or make you rings know? out of it or yeah. make other jewelry out of wow. it. Yeah. If Sal Polisi had he opened up a, a gold and silver exchange. That's right. That's how my father and my father didn't like Sal <laughs> because of that reason. <laughs> because Sal was like became like his competition right, or whatever. Right. But uh, yeah. So and that that's what they did. And and uh, and uh, Tony even got arrested for in there because he he bought watches off uh, uh, an undercover cop. Uh. And it was so funny because. After the guy walked out of the, the store, because I used to hang out in there. After the guy walked out of the store, Tony looked at me and goes, I'm going to get pinched. I go, why? He goes, that guy was a cop. Wow. He goes, I knew it. I, yeah. I just have that feeling. Sure enough, the next day they came in. And then the judge, Brenna, that Sal Polisi. Informed on? Right. The he, dirty, dirty judge. Yeah, he was the judge that the case actually went in front of him. We paid him 25000 and he dismissed the charges. Okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> let's talk about that. If you did take a pinch during this time, the 70s and 80s, yeah. in especially in Queens County, right. we're talking the deep boroughs, right. there was a good chance that you guys were able to pay your way out of it. Can you yeah. 
talk about so that. So there was more? this judge named Judge Brenner. He was involved with the Genovese family. He was so he, there was this restaurant that still opened that this guy Tough Tony owned, Tony Corona. He just passed away not long ago. He was a very powerful Genovese captain. But what he, he had he owns this restaurant called Parkside that's in Corona, Queens. That's been there for many, 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 mm. many years. And this and a lot of people used to go there and eat dinner because it's a really good restaurant. So you had all kinds of walks of life, like legitimate people, judges, lawyers, wise guys, mm -hmm. everybody went there, which we went there ourselves. And this Judge Brenner used to go there often because Queens, the courthouse was right near the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And this judge used to go there all the time and Tony got to him. Right. So when your case went in front of him, you went to Tony and Tony went to the judge. So that's what happened. So Tony got arrested and it got put in, and now you try to get it in front of him. Right. The lawyers, whatever, right. maneuver, get the case in front of Brenner. Yeah. He's a Supreme Court judge, Queens County Supreme Court judge, and the case, Tony Lee's case got put in front of him. And then we went to Tony. We gave Tony 25000 mm. Tony gave it to the judge, and the judge dismissed the charges. And, and, and depending on the severity of the case, that the price would either without, go up or right. down, right? Without like, a doubt. okay, if this is a aggravated assault, yeah, well, you might be paying a, 50 grand. Yeah. Of course, that's a different story because then now it gets a little more, you know, more, a little more involved. We're right. talking about like stolen rest watches that weren't even stolen. They were brought in by an undercover cop. That's a I mean? lot of money yeah. for just a stolen watch yeah, to well, get yourself you know, out. Yeah, but it, freedom is priceless. That's, that's right, because you can't street. earn when you're you behind you know, bars. My father used to tell me two things. You can't make, you, you, you got to stay healthy and stay free. You can't make money if you're sick and you can't make money if you're in jail. Yeah. Yeah, and then for a guy named Fat Tony giving out health <laughs> advice, that is, uh, yeah. he, you know, he means it. Yeah, yeah. Guys, let me take a quick minute to tell you about Factor Meals. It's the new year, and has your resolution to drop a pound or two already gone totally off the rails? It probably has. Factor has you covered with ready-to-eat meal delivery that sends chef-prepared, dietitian approved meals straight to your door. All you have to do is heat them up in the microwave or skillet for two minutes, and dinner is served. Guys, I've said this before. Going to the grocery store when you combine time, gas, and inflation actually costs you more money than getting on a factor meal plan. It's the truth. It's There's no reason you should be going to the grocery store anymore. With over 35 meal options to choose from each week, including options that are keto, calorie smart, vegan, vegetarian, and more, you never have to choose between delicious food and meeting your health goals. Whatever you need out of your nutrition routine, Factor has you covered. Head to factormeals.com slash connect50 and use code connect50 to get 50% off. That's code connect, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-5-0, connect50 at factormeals.com slash connect50 to get 50% off. You guys, start eating healthy, start eating more efficient, forget about the grocery store, Get your meals from Factor Meals. Do it right now. Thank you so much. So, okay, so your dad is hustling. Money is coming in from every angle. Right. Uh, he's just a he's a he's a street guy. Does he does he move up to captain or does he just well, stay not, as not a soldier then, but later on? So, but he was very powerful. So, what happens now? He's putting together this crew, and they're bringing other guys in, like they're bringing their friends in. So now. At one point, he had like 75, 80 guys with him. Like, and wow. you're talking about like a lot of them were really good guys and earnings. And yeah. now these guys, they start, they're starting Shylock businesses. Right. They're starting number businesses. They're starting the bookmaking businesses. They're hijacking trucks. And a lot right. of things are going on. Now, also, the mob is running unions. Ugh. So there's a union called the Tapers Union. That's the Sheetrock Union. Mm. So those are the people that put up sheet. Every construction thing had its own union like the bricklayers had a union the the carpenters had a yeah. union the plumbers had a, yeah. and the, they called this union it was the tapers union they were the guys that put up the sheetrock mm. that union was always run by wise guys in east new york by murder inc but what happened was when murder inc went out of business when they all got the electric chair it sort of got lost in the shuffle this union and charlie wagons never looked into it, never bothered with it. Mm. When my father got straightened out, he knew about this union because of he was raised by Murder, Inc. Because his best friends, fathers and uncles were in Murder, Inc. So he knew about this union. So he went to Gambino 
now is the boss, and he told Gambino he was going to go after this union to try to get it back for the family. Mm. And Carl gave him the okay, and my father went after this union, and he took over this union, the tape is union. Okay, now I like to think I know a lot about how the mob makes or made money. I still can't wrap my head around it, so please explain for us how does the mafia make money from unions? Okay, there's a lot. There's a couple of different ways. So first, the best, the main way is the dues, the union dues. So everybody pays union dues, mm. right? The union dues are invested, like a four, like a four hundred one k, whatever. Pension, they call, right? They're invested. So what they do is, so now the union collects all the union dues, and the mob goes to them. Okay, listen, we're going to build a hotel up on a on a uh, you know Sunset Strip, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna and they built they use the union dues for the hotel, but who owns the hotel? The mob owns right. the hotel, right? But it's paid for by with the union dues, which and that's what Jimmy Hoffa was doing with exactly. the Teamsters pension, with building casinos in Vegas, in Vegas for the mob, right. exactly. And that's what it is: the pension fund, the union dues, the union dues all going to the pension fund. Right. It's all part of the union dues. How my father made money was that way also, but what he actually got it so. Now he goes after the union and they sn he snatches up the president of the union, right? He actually got arrested for it. For, he, for leaning on him, right? right? For extorting the union. Mm -hmm. he, got, he got found out guilty over a technicality. I don't know, when the guy was testifying, he made some kind of mistake and he, he beat the case. Mm -hmm. So now he took over the union and what he was getting every month was an envelope. So in other words, they were skimming. So every month he was getting, I don't know, 5,000 or whatever he was getting. He was getting a couple of thousand mm -hmm. a month and he went to, and the best is, this is, and what happened was he goes to, so now he takes over the union, the president's with him, he takes the union over and then he goes to see Carl Gambino and Gambino, now he tells Gambino, we're getting X amount of dollars a month and Gambino tells my father, well, you know, this belongs, now this is after my father took over the union, got arrested, paid for all the lawyers on yeah. his own, beat the case. Mm. Gambino turns around and tells my father, you know, this union belongs to the family, right? So my father says, wants to say, no, it belongs to me. Right. But he says, yeah, of course, it belongs to the family. He goes, okay, you take $2,000 a month and you service the union for the family. Mm -hmm. My father didn't like that, but he had no choice. Years later, when Paul Castellano became the boss, he sends for my father because now he, he wants to know about the union because they had all the unions. They mm -hmm. had what they they had this thing called the club, and they were fixing bids, construction right. bids. So they sent for my father to talk about the tapers union. And Paul asks my father, "What's your end out of this union?" And my father tells him, "He goes, that's all you get." <laughs> he goes, "Yeah, your cousin. That's all he gave me." <laughs> and Paul upped it. Pull okay, up my I father's see. end. Right. Which, um, yeah. That so your father he was able to to start with the tapers union and work his way out. Yeah. And, and seize a lot of these unions that were kind of in disarray. Well, he no. He what he did he start he got with the tapers union. Then he opened up. Uh, he went partners in a in a in a dry well in a company that that did that. So right. he had a with this guy with Mike Goodell. This guy's name was he owned a big uh, drywall company and major. And they and that was the company that they are the companies that sheetrock right. the, the construction jobs. Right. So if there's so, a house going up in Ozone building, Park, right. your dry your dad's drywall company's getting right. that and, bid. Right. Otherwise the union ain't gonna send, you know, the union, you're not gonna get no workers. Right. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Okay, can you explain no no show jobs? Well, yeah. So I had a no show job. So a no-show job is so we come to, we ha, we're on a construction site. So the, so let let's say, um so my father had the tapers union. So what he'll do is so uh he'll you'll he'll they'll put you on the payroll on a job site like with Michael's. So I you have a company that wants this job, yeah. Right? You, so okay, you could have this job. I want five no-show jobs. So you're just gonna give a name and a social security number, and you're gonna get a check every week for not going to the job. It's part of it's so part of like an extortion scheme. Yeah, let's say. right. That's what it. So you, you're extorting the job legally to make it look legit. Right. Like I had a like when I got out of jail in '80, um, my brother-in-law was the head maintenance guy at the Delmonico Hotel in Brooklyn, in mm. Manhattan. Right. It's a major hotel. I had a no show. I was on the payroll 
and I got a check every week, but I never went to the job because I needed a job for parole. And mm, when my parole officer yeah. would go there, they would tell him I was on the swing shift. So if he went there <laughs> in the day, I'm on the swing shift, I'm working in the night. And no and PO's if, working at night. Right, right. So, so I, you know, and, but as long as I showed him the pay stub, he was okay with that. Right. So that was a no-show job. A no-show job is just, if you want the job, you could have the job, but you, I, I, you know, like, um, I see. So, so in other and words, another way, there's more to it because okay. what happened was plus to make it look good. Some guys would go to the job for an hour and just drink coffee and leave. They would be made foremans. Like I know guys, well, I, I know wise guys that were foremans on the job. Mm. They make even more money, but they had to come to the job to make it look good. So they would just go there to the job and sit there for an hour or two, mm -hmm. drink a couple of cups of coffee, yeah, and then leave, right, and get and then a foreman. So if there is a union that's working on a job site at a hotel, wherever there is a union workforce, and that union is infiltrated by, say, the Gambinos, the Gambinos tell whoever the investor or the owner of the company. You owe us for 10 jobs, but right. there's only seven workers there. Right. So that profit is taken from that three no-show right. jobs. Right. Right. Plus- It's like skimming. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Plus, and also you do get people real jobs. Right. You know, like right. nephews, of cousins, like the Javits Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Manhattan. I'm sure you yeah. heard of the Javits Center. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a convention center in Manhattan. Yeah. It was built by the mob. Right. The Genovese family literally- ran, had the Javits Center. You couldn't get a job in the Javits Center without being connected to the Genovese wow. family. Like everybody that worked in there had somebody they were related to or someone they knew in the Genovese family. This was a major convention center in Manhattan. That's still major the Javits, today. Yeah, they yeah. have. Uh, now everybody I know that worked in there had relatives all my friends that worked in there were Genovese guys, sons and cousins and nephews. They all worked in the Javits Center. You see that payroll chart? It's just a bunch yeah. of Italian and, surnames. And when Giuliani came into off, when Giuliani, Giuliani closed, got them all, and he got cleared it all up. Right. The Fulton Fish Market. All the right. mob people worked in the Fulton Fish Market. Right. You couldn't get a job in the Fulton Fish Market without being mobbed up. You right. couldn't get a, a job in the convention center. Even the play, even Broadway. The, you go to you ever go to a Broadway play? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know the old ladies that give out the in the beginning you get that little pamphlet, sure. right? Yeah. So Broadway's on the west side of Manhattan. The west side of Manhattan was run by the Westies, the Irish, right? Who were affiliated with the Genovese family. Ah, uh, all them old ladies that worked in there were all their aunts and mothers. You right. couldn't get a job on Broadway without going to the Westies. Right, the pier on the west side. The, you couldn't get a job. All their all their aunts and 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 were used to work the boots, the ticket mm -hmm. boots. You couldn't. The, they had everything locked yeah, down. The yeah, mob. yeah. New York in the seventies and eighties. I mean, they built a yeah. lot of buildings. They they had their hooks in everything. Everything. So let's back up to you. Now mm -hmm. you're you're witnessing this. You're kind of starting to come of age in this era. I think you're 16 when you dropped out of school mm -hmm. and you went to work for your dad. Right. So when I was 16, I got suspended. I was I never liked school. I was a truant. Um, once I, I get once I found out that my father was in the mob and everything, and I knew he was a criminal, like I sort of I don't know I thought it would be okay, you know, like my train of thought changed like mm -hmm. a little. So I I became a truant and I started getting in trouble in school. And then when I was sixteen, I got suspended, and my father really goes upset. He didn't talk to me, um, and he would just come home and look at me, and he'd walk in the bedroom and he wouldn't talk to me. So I called up my uncle Frank, his older brother. Excuse me. And I said, listen, this, he don't want to talk to me. You need to come here. So my Uncle Frank came to my house and we had to sit down in my kitchen, the three of us. And he listened to my Uncle Frank because there was a big age gap. My father was the youngest of eight and my uncle was like 20 years older than my father. Like, and was he also involved? Yeah, he was. He worked for the uh, transit, but he was a Shylock, a bookmaker, mm -hmm. but, he, but he had a legitimate job, uh. but he was never made or anything. Um, so we sit down and my uncle tells my father, what are you going to do? This kid, you got to put him to work. I mean, he's, you know, what, he doesn't want to go back to school. So my father looked at me, goes, you want a job? I said, yeah. So he says, okay, I'll get you in the bricklayers union or the tapers union. I said, mm -hmm. I don't, the bricklayers, because bricklayers made a lot of money back then. Right. Because everything was made in brick, not like today. 
I said, I don't want to be no fucking bricklayer. You know, he goes, what do you mean? He goes, what do you want to do? I go, I, I want to work for you. He goes, you want to work for me? And I don't know, he sort of like just looked at me and then he, and then he took his finger and he, and he went, well, if you want to work for me, remember one thing, going to jail is all part of the job. And now here I am, 16, I'm already lost. And I go, yeah, that's fine. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't care. Mm. And um, the next day, he put me to work. He took me to this uh, club in uh, Merrick Road in Long Island. This guy, Philly the Pimp, owned it. I, he, I, don't, I don't think he was a pimp. He might have been a pimp at mm. one time, but that was his <laughs> nickname, Philly the Pimp. And he had a blackjack game mm. in there. A big blackjack game, and I that was my first illegal job. I worked in the blackjack game, but uh -huh. I worked. I just stood there and I got paid. Right, you know, you know I just hung out. But and were you fascinated by it? Did I loved it? Was it. it exciting? Yeah, because what happened was once I drifted off my block when I was like thirteen. You know, because back then we all hung out on our block. Mm. When we were little kids. We played ring alivio, stickball, mm -hmm. and stoop ball on our block. When I. Turned 13, I drifted off my block into the neighborhood until like I started hanging out by this pizzeria. And that's when my father took me and I met John Gotti and I met all mm -hmm. these wise guys. Of course, now my father was concerned. I'm running around the neighborhood. He didn't want me to get hurt. He wanted everybody to know I was his son. And I always knew there was something different growing up even when I was little. Now I find out who he is and I started getting like some respect from everybody because now I'm Fat Andy's son. Mm -hmm. You know, and I started feeling special. Yeah. And I like the feeling. Of course. Yeah, the Italians, you know, everybody that talks about the reason that they joined the life, you know, it's for respect and a feeling of belonging. You never hear people say, I joined because of the money. You know, you mm -hmm. could always go get a package of dope and sell it and make money that way. It, you know, it kind of reminds me of like, the way that black street gangs in Los Angeles formed because people wanted to belong. You know, it's a sense of uh, community in a place that doesn't have a lot of maybe legal opportunity. Mm. So it sounds kind of like that's that was your path. Hey guys, let me take a quick minute to thank our amazing sponsor, ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like leaving your keys in your car while you run into the gas station for a snack. Most of the time, you're probably fine. But if you come back to see someone driving off with your car, what are you going to do? It doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack someone. A 12-year-old nowadays could do it. When you connect to an unencrypted network, like at hotels and airports, any hacker can gain access to your data. That's why you got to get a VPN, a virtual private network. It's easy to use. Fire up the app and click one button to get protected, and it works on all your devices, phones, laptops, tablets, so you can always stay safe. I mean, it's even a great way to go shopping. When I buy international flights, for example, I log on to ExpressVPN. That way, they can't see where you are, and you can actually get better prices. Isn't that messed up? Airlines can see where you're located and charge you more money depending on on what market you're in, ExpressVPN gets rid of all that. That's why I use ExpressVPN. When I'm on the road, I know it will keep me secure anywhere. When I'm using ExpressVPN, I know I'm getting the best protection. Secure your data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash connectpod. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash connectpod and you get an extra three months free when you sign up, okay? ExpressVPN.com slash ConnectPod. So go sign up for ExpressVPN and put your internet condom on today. Let's get back into the show. So now we're in the 70s and you're, you're a teenager, you know, get moving into your 20s. Uh, what are some of your hustles? You know, obviously you're working your dad's games, you're mm. working the dice games in the Bronx. Uh, how does that evolve? Tell us what your best earning uh, schemes were in yes. that era. So now I, I went to work in the blackjack game. Then I started working in the dice games. Now I'm getting paid. Now don't forget, this is 1970, 71. So I'm, I'm making $100 a day, $200 a day. You're talking, that's a lot of money yeah. back then. But today that's thousands of dollars a day. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like everything back then was two for a penny. You know, right. in them days, the bus was 15 cents. Yeah. Now it's $5, you know what yeah. I mean? So so money was money then. So mm -hmm. now here I am, I'm 16, 17. I'm making 100 a day, 200 a day. You know, I'm living, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the Copacabana. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm drinking. And uh, so, you know, just like, uh, just like him, just like, uh, you know, like I'm in the minor leagues. Let's yeah. say so. I'm working in the dice game. I'm 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 writing numbers. I'm writing numbers. Um, I got I'm starting. I got like maybe a half sheet with a bookmaker. I'm selling. There's there's there there are 
they're hijacking trucks. I'm selling stuff for them. Mm -hmm. I'm making money with that. The 4th of July, I'm selling all kinds of fireworks because they're illegal in New York. Right. So, you know, I'm, and I'm starting to make money in the street, like, mm -hmm. with, like everybody else it makes money and money starting to roll in. Um, then I got it. And then I'm working in, in my father had a big, uh, they had a number of business uh, with this guy, Joe, the cat. Then when I was about 18, I, I, I went to work in the number. I learned the number business and I would work in the number office and I would, I would, uh, make the ribbons. I would count and I would get paid like 500 a week for that. You know what wow. I mean? That, so we're talking. Where was money. this number office? It was in Manhattan. Like I actually got arrested. That was the first time my name was ever in the newspaper. So in 1974, we had, we would have, we were banking numbers out of Staten Island and we had the number office on Mulberry street. Can I stop you right there? Yeah. Could you please, before you get into this story, explain yeah. the numbers? Okay. Cause so, this is a lost thing. There right. is no more number. Racket. Right. So what happened was it originated in Harlem at the turn of the century um, African Americans, they invented it. It was all pennies and nickels, and nobody was paying attention to it. Right. So it evolved. So then what happened was actually Dutch Schultz, who was a famous gangster, he was out of Harlem. He got wind of this that these people were making crazy money with pennies and nickels, mm -hmm. making big money. And he took it over. And then the Italian mob took it over from him. And what it is is so, like I said earlier, the racetrack was huge, right? People would, tens of thousands of people would be in the racetrack betting horses. And every day in the Daily News, they would have the results, the chart, right? Of the nine races. On the bottom of the chart, it would have the daily mutual handle. That was how much money was bet in the nine races. Okay. Every day, okay? It would be called the daily mutual handle. Right. And it would be like, let's say, so it would say 2 million 530,126 dollars. The number that day would be 126. It was the last three numbers of the total mutual handle and, and is of this, the racetrack. Okay, gotcha. So this is connected to horses. Horses. Perfect. Okay, yeah, great. Right. Continue. I'm sorry. Okay. So it's all connected to the horse racing. Okay. It's it's all it's all connected to the daily mutual handle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the last three numbers was the number. And it was 500 to one. So if you bet a dollar and you hit the number, you got $500. Right. Okay. It was 500 to one. So we had runners. Okay. So let's say you were a runner and you had, you worked in a warehouse where there was 200 workers. You wrote numbers in that warehouse. Mm. Every, that you, if, every day, if you took $1,000 worth of numbers, you got 25%. We would pay right. you 25%, and you would, turn the, you would turn them numbers into a controller. Right. The controller got 35%. So, so the, there, was the, let me, there was the bank, mm -hmm. then there was the controllers, and then there was the number runners. Mm -hmm. The bank gave the controller 35% of the gross. The controller gave the runner 25%. So the controller made 10%. Collected all the work, turned it into the bank. I worked for the bank. Right. The Found numbers me. office in right. Manhattan. In Manhattan on Mulberry Street. And it got raided. So my father was going to take us one night to Peter Lugas. Famous hey, hang steakhouse. on. I'm sorry. You got you to finish this. Well, good. So, so all this money gets collected every day all around the city from different runners. Right. Goes to different offices right. that are controlled up, man. by up, different man. families. Um, and then if, depending on where does the bank's money the bank is there. The bank is the bank. Right. So this is essentially just an offshoot. It is another gambling racket that's totally separate from the horse gambling racket. It's made up. Yeah, it's totally different. Horse spending is one thing. Numbers is a completely different thing. But the number business, now you have a lot of people work for you. You have pickup men. Right. You have runners. Okay. The runners come every day and turn in the money at the end of the day. They, they call in the work. Right. Or they have, we have a pickup man that goes around that picks, because everything's written on, all the numbers right. are written down. Right. It's not, you know, it's not, you know, there's no smartphones. Right. There's no internet back right. then. So, so the numbers, we used to call them books, number books, and the mm -hmm. number runner would pick up all the all the books right right and then he would bring the number the books to the controller and the controller would it would 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 add up all add them up like do to add mm -hmm. up all the work and then the, collect all the money and then turn that money into the bank when the numbers hit the bank if sometimes you lose money right like, there was a plane crash once like 
because it's very number betting is very superstitious. Right. People bet on dreams. There's yeah. dream, you know, back then, you know, birthdays, dreams, like even tragedies. Like there was a plane crash back in years ago in the 70s, and the 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 plane number was like, I don't know, four four five, flight four four five, and the whole world played four four five and it came out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So wow. so like we lost crazy money. Oh my you know god. Like, like so so we had to pay it, you know, right. like so uh, so Every, a lot of people made money with it. And okay, so the know. ordinary person, say I'm a I'm an old lady and I want to bet my grandson's birthday, even though it's four numbers, but yeah. whatever. Here's a dollar. So you put in your bet with the dollar, right? right? So all the cash comes in first, of right. course. All the cash comes okay. in first. Okay, makes right. sense. And then some people played weekly numbers, like we played numbers by the week. Like we, you could play. Give me a one, two, three, five dollars a day, you know, forever. And then every every week, you just give me you know, $35, you know what I mean? Wow. For the seven days. Listen, my father's business, we were doing, we were doing 90,000 a day. We weren't making 90,000 a day, right. but that's what we were doing. That's what you were bringing it off the street. Right. We were bringing in 90,000 a day out from Jamaica, Queens. All, we had number spots in all the bodegas and wow. in the, so now all them number spots have lotto machines. Right. So, so I'm, I'm working on Mulberry Street. We're working in the office. It's, we'll, I'm, I'm in the Ravenite. Cause I'm in the Raven. Ironically, I'm in the Ravenite. It's 1974. I'm in the Raven. I just turned 21. I'm in the Ravenite. We're going to go to Peter Lugas for dinner. And I tell my father, listen, before we go to Peter Lugas, I got to go up the street to the office. I got to do some stuff. I got to tie up some ends and stuff. So he says, okay. So now we had traps. All right. So what a trap was, we had a cut. So what a trap is, it's, it's like um, a piece of furniture and, you know, you take a you take something out and you lift it up and you hide something in it. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then you know, and you can't tell something's hidden in it. Of course. So we had a trap. We had a footstool, like a, and all the a lot of the work was in the trap. Mm. So anyway, I go up the street to the office. I walk up. It's in a tenement building. I'm over. Should I walk up the stairs? And there were steps leading up to the roof. I was on the top floor, and I put the key in and I open up the door and I hear footsteps and I went, oh fuck. And they're boom, and they came rushing in on me. Get him. They threw me in the office, threw me up against the wall. And uh was it feds? No, it was the it was the it was back then they used to call it the moral squad. It was this it, it was like the beginning of the organized crime task force, the state organized right. crime. But they used to call it back then the moral squad, <laughs> which used to go after prostitutes and gamblers. Right. That was what they called it, the moral squad. And they raided the house and they locked me up. And the, that was the first time my name was in the newspaper. Wow. So you took a pinch. Yeah, I took a pinch. Yeah, and, and I got, I got a, I paid a fine. I paid a, I think it was a $1,500 fine. Wow. I paid, they took me to the Elizabeth Street precinct. And that's another thing. So now my name was ever, now I'm 21. Mm -hmm. My name's in the daily news. Mm -hmm. I went out that Friday night. I walked into the disco, you know, that I was hanging out in yeah. on Queens Boulevard, the monastery. I walked in. I was like a celebrity, you know? Right. So now, you know, that you feed into that. You know, you don't ever want, it's like, it's like heroin. Right. You know, it's like drugs. Now, now. you got it. Now you like got a stripe. Yeah. Now, oh my God, we didn't know. Oh, you're fat and, you know, like people that didn't really know me are walking up to me. Oh my God, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. or, you know, you, it, it was the girls are, you know, now you it's just, you get lost. <clears throat> right. Right. Yeah. So now you're becoming your own man. Right. You're kind of, you know, not just Fat Andy's yeah. son anymore. You're becoming, you know, uh, a wise guy. Yeah. So what happened was then I started putting together my own little crew. You know, guys I knew, kids I knew in the neighborhood. They, my father liked them. Like my my father's godson, little Joe, he became my partner. He passed away now. This guy, Sal, this guy, Frankie, you know, all kids in my name. We all grew up together. Mm. You know, we trusted each other. We started doing things, you know, um... We started, you know, doing, we we all did. We were all, you know, into numbers. You know, we were into what the mob was into, yeah. whatever, selling porn. You know, yeah. we were getting eight millimeter porn from DB. You know, he was the big distributor. We were selling untaxed cigarettes. Mm -hmm. We had the Nikki and Lenny, who my father were getting cigarettes from down south. We were selling cases of untaxed cigarettes. So we were doing whatever we could to make money. What do you think your best earner was, uh, before 1980, when when you went to prison, or I think 78. What do you think your best earning? My racket best earning was? bracket back then was 
probably the number business, mm -hmm. the number business, probably yeah. because, you know, we were making crazy money, you know, and then plus I was getting to pay, you know, yeah. um, but it, we were spending it all. I, I made the most money I ever made personally on my own was, um, in, in from 88 to, I went to jail in 96. Them years was for me personally, when I made my own personal money, like, when I was, you know what I mean? But right, I, I when you owned that. your own Right, when I was, yeah, spots. right. My father was in jail and yeah. now I'm proposed. I was getting ready to get straightened out. And I started, you know, and I and, and I started doing things on my own, like right. on my own. Tony Lee had died in yeah. 93, you know, so I started doing things. But back then I was making so much money, but we were spending it as fast as we got it. We were kids. I was a kid. I'm in right. my 20s. I'm hanging out in in the Copacabana. Yeah. I'm Fatty Andy's son. Uh, you know, I... Uh, it just was a crazy time. Yeah, you yeah. know, with partying, with smoking mm -hmm. weed, with snorting coke. I mean, yeah. I'm in all these big discos in Manhattan, meeting celebrities. My father's hanging out with Frank Sinatra. You know, Frankie Valley's coming to my house for dinner. You know, it just wow. was a crazy time. And you guys were still in Ozone Park. Yeah, on and 88th you, Street. My father bought his first house. So we lived, we moved into, oh, how I moved into Ozone Park. We lived in East New York on Belmont Avenue. My aunt, my mother's sister, inherited a house with her husband on 87th Street in Ozone Park. And that was our first time. We moved into that house on 87th Street. That's how we got into Ozone Park. Um, then, then my grandfather bought a house on 91st Street and we moved into his house. Mm. Then my father finally bought his first house on 88th Street, across the street from the park. And then we moved into that house mm. on 88th Street. And that's mm. where we stood all them years up right. until he passed away. Um, and now you're going down to Florida, I believe, yeah, too. Yeah, well, we he started going down to Florida in 1980. And what was the action down there? Well, he what happened was he kept on getting in trouble in New York. There was this, this DA in Suffolk County, Long Island, that kept on giving him subpoenas over a book. He had a big bookmaking business out in Long Island with this guy, Johnny Boy. They had a major sports betting ring out mm. there. And this DA in Suffolk County kept on subpoenaing him. And naturally, he kept on taking the fifth, and he kept on going to jail. 30 days, 60 days a year for contempt of court. Mm. So he told me, this guy's going to 30-day me to death, yeah. he told me. Yeah. So he, he said, I'm going to Florida. So he had friends in Florida. He had really good friends in Florida. So he went to Florida, and he opened up an, a, re a restaurant. Mm. And he started making moves in Florida. So now he had New York going, because yeah. he still had, he had the gold and silver exchange yeah. with Tony Lee. And he had a lot of things going in New York, and Tony Lee was running that. And he started running things in Florida. He had a uh, he opened up a sports business in Miami. Yeah, he uh, they opened up a a, a, a speedboat rental, mm. an arcade, a pizzeria. Yeah, you know he started making moves. He started Shylock of money. Yeah, you know, and he did did what mob guys start doing. Just just replicated what he did in New York. Right, and then he had a big reputation down there, so everybody was up his ass in Florida. Meaning. Like, oh, like uh, looked yeah, up to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, Wanted yeah. Wanted to do yeah. favors yeah, for yeah. him. Yeah, coming to him with stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. now he had this, you know, he's Fat Andy. Now he's in Florida. Right. You know, and he used to tell them. So when things, he's, so it's funny because we had to sit down. So there's 50 states in the United States, right? 50 states. So we, so something jumped off with this wise guy named Demas. He was from New Jersey, right? So we have a sit down in this place called Charlie Brown's. He was on Hollandale Beach Boulevard. It was over the sports betting. Guys owned my old this guy, the bookmaker that was with my father. Guys owed him money. Mm. This guy, Freddie. Guys owed him money. So we sit down. Demas, Freddie, my father, I'm there. And so Demas tells my father, he goes, Andy, it's different down here. You know, they don't recognize us down here like they do in New York. So my father goes, what? I'm recognized in 51 states in the United States. <laughs> and my father's from Larry went, there's only 50 states. <laughs> my father goes, well, if they make another state, I'll be recognized there too. You he he, he meant Puerto Rico. Yeah, 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 yeah. He said, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my father told him, what did the guy do with the sun? Toast your brain down here? He <laughs> told him, yeah. But, uh, you know, so it was, it was, he started making a lot of money down mm -hmm. here. So I mean, and he was doing business with cartel guys, not drugs. They were bringing him stuff. He never with drugs. Mm -hmm. He was dead against drugs. I had many arguments with him over that. Yeah, your father sounds like he was very old school mafia, stuck by the rules, never sold drugs, 
never opened his mouth ever. No, no. Like never gave the government anything. You said on an interview that he would get arrested sometimes and refuse to even give his name. Yeah. <laughs> he got subpoenaed once in the judge and, and, and he had to go, you know, he got subpoenaed to go in front of the grand jury. And when he went in front of the grand jury, like he wouldn't even tell them his name. And the judge <laughs> says, we only want to know your name. He goes, well, I'm not telling you. <laughs> He said, he, goes, I'm not, he wouldn't even tell them his name. You know, and that is the right of an American citizen. That's yeah, exactly. a constitutional yeah, yeah. right that yeah. the wise guys yeah, just yeah. kind of inherently right. uh, yeah. understood. He was very old school, especially when it came to drugs. He used to tell me, I'm not selling drugs because they'll make, I'll be the guy they make an example out of because it was, it was against the rules, what mm -hmm. people were doing, especially in Florida. Now, this is 1980. Everybody was dealing blow. I mean, right. it was crazy. Did you get into that? I never, I, I mean, I, I dibbled and dabbed. I sold the key here and key there, but I got involved. I, I got, I was, I got involved using it. You were, you really a user. I, got, I started using it. You, you, you had know, a code I, problem. It kind of got away from you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, definitely got away with me, got away from me. So it, it started getting away from me when he came to Florida because it was so cheap down here. Like mm. down here in Florida, what I was paying $30 for a gram in New York was 120 Right. You, know, you right. know what I mean? There was a big difference. Yeah. So, but we started making a lot of money down here. He opened up an Italian restaurant. I mean, there was, and uh, and then uh, he started um, doing stuff and then um, he hooked. So what happened was Paul Castellano sent, sent for him. Okay, uh, real quick. I just yeah. want to, mm -hmm. so we're, we're coming into a different era now right. where uh, the boss who originally made your father, what, what was his name? Albert Anastasia. Albert Anastasia. He got murdered. He got murdered. What was that about? Was that Paul Castellano behind no, that murder? That was Carlo Gambino. So Carlo Gambino was a captain in, in that family, the Mangano family. They didn't get along. Genovese wanted Frank Costello out of the picture. And Frank Costello was what I've been understanding Frank Costello was were, were together. So they shot Frank Costello in the head. He lived. He retired. And they needed to get Albert Anastasia out of the way. And Albert Anastasia was assassinated. Was that the in the, the, in the East New York? No, that was in the barber shop okay. in Brooklyn, I mean Manhattan. My father's regime was Albert Anastasia's main regime. Tommy Rabbit, they were all his hitmen. Uh, Albert Anastasia, Carlo Gambino became the boss, right? And my father and all of them, they went like what they say. They went to, to onto the carpet. They they like they went to the mattress. They want so now there was a little war going on. They uh, wanted to actually kill. Carlo Gambino because he killed their boss. Right. And also he killed their captain, Tommy Rava, disappeared. Right. So now they, they were trying to kill Gambino. So Gambino. now even though everybody is part of the Gambino crew, these are different factions right, different that have factions. beef. Right. I got it. So now my father always told me that Albert Anastasia was the toughest guy he ever met and Carlo Gambino was the smartest guy he ever met. Mm. So what happened was now Carlo Gambino becomes the boss they're trying to kill him. He knew that they he needed them because they were all stand up guys. Yeah, he sends a guy to Arnel Delacroix. He became who later became the underboss to come in. He wanted them to come in. Now my father told me so. He lived in Brooklyn. He called them into his basement one at a time, and he told my father, "I know you were just a soldier. You were taking orders." Mm. Um, and you know, I want you back and, and, and they all made up and then he made Neil the captain. Okay. And that's how they all got around. And then, then my father used to say, yeah. And then he made us kill people for him. Right. And they became his guys. You right. You know what I mean? Cause he knew what he had there. Right. So he kind of made the peace. He said, there's no beef. Right. Let's, right. let's get and back then my together. My father actually killed a few guys for him. My father killed, I have an article. My father killed the guy in, uh, in, 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 um, him and another guy, they shot a guy in a florist. They had makeup on and they went in this florist and they shot this guy five times. He was a wise guy with the Gambinos, but they thought he was an informant and they murdered him in a, in a florist. So my father actually did work for him, yeah. for Carl. He liked my father. My father got along good with him. So getting back to Florida, so now Paul Castellano sends for my father. Now, Paul is at this time- He's the boss. So how did he take it over from okay. Carlo Gambino? So Carlo Gambino's dying. Okay. Neil, uh, Neil is the underboss. Everybody assumed that Neil Delacroix was going to become the boss. On his deathbed, he appoints Paul Castellano okay. as the boss. And Neil was okay with that. 
People got mad at Neil John Gotti, my father. They all thought Neil should have declared himself the boss, which he should have, but he didn't. He probably didn't want the aggravation or whatever. Mm -hmm. He he was happy being the underboss. So Carlo Gambino anointed Paul Castellano. Mm -hmm. The captains voted Paul Castellano in. He became the boss of the family. He sensed for my father in like 1983, or no, 82 maybe. He sent to my father to come to New York. My father comes up to New York and he asks my father if my father knew the Traficante family out of Tampa. That was the mob family in Florida. Tampa. My father goes, yeah, I know them. He says, okay, listen, I need you to go back down there with Tommy A, this guy Tommy Agro, who was a, another soldier. Because back then, bingo halls in South Florida were huge. It was mm. before the Indians opened up the casinos. Mm. So they all had bingo halls and the mob was partners with all of them, big $50,000 jackpot bingo halls, wow. which were all mobbed up. Yeah. And Tommy Agro, Tommy A was having a beef with the Traficante family over a bingo hall. Mm. So my father goes, yeah, no problem. I'll take care. I know them. So Tommy and my father go to Florida. My, they sit down with the Traficantes. My father introduces Tommy. They straighten out whatever they got to straighten out. Tommy had a crew down there. And he asks my father, listen, when I'm not in town, Will you service my crew? And my father goes, yeah, of course I will, right? One of Tommy's crew members is a confidential informant, this guy Joe Dorr. We don't know. He starts bringing undercover FBI agents to my father as Shylock customers. Oh, man. And my father starts Shylocking right. FBI agents that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Now they bug my father's house. Yeah. They close down his restaurant because now in his restaurant... You go in his restaurant on any given night. Joe Tadere was there, the boss of Buffalo. Uh, Sam the Plumber's there, the boss of Jersey. Peanuts, the underboss of Cleveland is in there. Every night, there's mm -hmm. wise guys all over the restaurant. Right. The FBI walked in and just took the liquor license right off the wall. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing they closed down. They closed down the restaurant. And then uh, he got indicted. And um, he went on the lam. Okay. How long was he on the lam for? He was on the lam for maybe a little less than a year. And then okay. he got arrested. Uh, he got arrested and uh, and uh, he wound up getting 40 years. Wow. Yeah, he wound up getting 40. He did 13 years. He wound up getting 40 years. So that he got arrested in 84. Uh, so, and that was back when it, when you got fed time, when they gave you 40. It's not like today where you got to do 85% no, of no, that. No, no, no. You old, could actually old, get paroled. Yeah, yeah. You have to go to in front of the parole board. Okay. Uh, was that devastating for you or did that make you man up and say like i gotta earn i'm on my own now well what happened was he went to, he got the, he went to trial three times the first trial he got a hung jury after the trial tommy a his cold friend that got lung cancer and died so then he was on his own the second trial we fixed the jury where what uh where was this in Miami in in Dade County okay. in the federal court? How much did you guys pay to fix the jury? Twenty five thousand. So what happened was we had this guy. We had a friend of ours named Billy Martino. He was a knock around guy from South South Florida, um, and he comes to me one night and he goes, "Listen, my neighbor is on your father's jury. His neighbor, coincidence." He yeah. goes, "Well, you think he'll do something?" He goes, "I don't. I'll ask him." So he goes back and he comes back to me and he said, now this guy was a big bit of a degenerate gambler. This guy, Billy Martino, he comes back to me, he goes, listen, he don't want anything. He'll do something, but I want to give him 25,000. I said, all right. So I call up New York. I fly back up to New York, John Gotti and Tony Lee, give me 25,000. I fly back to Florida with the 25,000. I give I gave this guy Bailey Martino only twenty. I kept five for myself because <laughs> sure. now I'm, I'm you know I'm starting to lose it now with the drugs and mm -hmm. honestly you know mm -hmm. so I give him twenty thousand. I go here, yeah, listen, all I got is twenty thousand. So he takes the twenty thousand, and sure enough, the juror holds out, and we get another hung jury. Wow, eleven guilties, one not guilty. It was the jury that we paid the money <laughs> to. So now we get another hung jury, and then he went to trial the third time. Now every time he got. A hung jury, they condensed it. They dismissed some of the charges. Mm -hmm, right. And the last time he went to trial, he was only, it was three charges. It was a, a RICO, an extortion, and something else. And uh, he got convicted. So and I'm sure the government was trying to get him to take a deal. Well, they offered him a deal, but they double-crossed him. So what happened was he had co-defendants on the case that got six years. Mm. So he, after the second trial, 
they came to him and they told his lawyer, listen, if he pleads guilty, we won't give him no more than his co-defendants. Mm. Now, his co-defendants got six years. One got eight years, which he already had three years in, which right. would have been eight years was fine. Mm. Excuse me. So we agreed. Mm. He agreed. Mm. Now, the day of the sentencing, this guy comes in, this guy from from New York, this uh, mob specialist FBI guy comes in and he takes the stand because now they're having a hearing to, to determine the sentence and he starts saying he's a suspect in 18 murders and my this lawyer's jumping up. My client was never arrested for murder, never indicted for murder. Mm -hmm. would, and, and, and the wind-up is the judge gives my father 16 years. Just off the strength of this guy's well, yeah, statement. They do, yeah, so now... We fought it, so now he gets sentenced, which we shouldn't, and we 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 fought it, and uh, they retracted the mm -hmm. the sentence because mm -hmm. uh, it said, you know, we had lawyers testify. Listen, he said he wasn't going to get no more than his co defendants. Mm -hmm. The most the guy got was eight years. Anyway, they they vacate the plea, and he goes to trial a third time. He gets convicted. Right. The third trial was a kangaroo court. They brought in some visiting judge from Kansas that probably hates Italians. Hates Italians. Right. This visiting judge from Kansas. And when he sentenced my father, he told my father at the sentencing, you dis you've been disrespecting this country since you're 18 years old. Because my father went AWOL. He stabbed his drill sergeant. A whole big thing <laughs> happened when he was a kid. He went AWOL during the war. Um, and um, he said, you've been disrespecting this country since you're 18 years old. And he gave my father two 20-year sentences. Consecutively. Right. With a 13-year minimum. Mm. And so he did the minimum. He did the minimum. Luckily, he did the minimum. Then yeah. we hired this lawyer, this really good attorney named Linda Sheffield, who was a, a, a really out of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. She was um, good friends with Carmine Persico, the mm -hmm. boss of the Colombo family, Gene Gotti. She was a really good lawyer. She was great with appeals, with motions. Yeah. And she uh, she got him out. She got him yeah. out. How many bodies you know, now that it's all said and done, your father's gone, every, the, your, the life is behind you. How many bodies did your father have on him? I know of seven, mm -hmm. but there's more. There's more. He really, you know, I know of seven, like uh, some grisly murders, like where axes were involved and, you know, like, uh, but I, I know of like six or seven, but so, there, there was probably more than that. Yeah, most likely. Probably. Like the FBI told me a lot of stuff that, like, like I didn't know, like, like I knew the guy got murdered and he, but he told me like other things, you know, like he just, did, cause like some of them were my friends, not, not, well, not, you know, some of them were guys that were around us. Like this guy, F Fat Albie, he was a bookmaker, you know, um, and they found him like in the woods with his leg cut off, like he was tortured and, and, uh, and, and so when he died, I said, you know, Fat, what happened to Fat Albie? He goes, oh, I told him. He he went to do business with guys he met in jail and they they killed them. So I believed it, you know. Yeah. So now when I started cooperating with the government, the government kept asking me, you know, what do you know about Fat Albi? And I says to them, the story my father told me. Yeah. And they said, no, that's not what happened. I go, what do you mean that's not what happened? They said, you sure your father had nothing to do with that? I said, no, they were friends. But, you know, evidently he, they weren't, you know, he yeah. had something to do with it. Yeah, And in the mob, if you're told yeah. to kill your friend... Oh, that's no. what it is. Well, that was it. That was that was Fat Albie. That was more into how do you say that? Uh, that was just amongst them, you know. Right. But I'm sure it was just a personal got, beef. I'm sure my father got permission. So if, if you in the mob, so when you want to commit a murder, like let's say we have an internal beef, yeah, going on. Like you're in our crew, but there's an internal beef going on. Something maybe we don't trust you no more. Mm -hmm. or you robbed us. Or you did something underhanded. Yeah. So we would get permission to kill you from the boss and then we kill you. But if the order came down from the top, that's a different story. Right. Like, but some people would, some people actually volunteered. Right. Like if, like if, 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 if a thing came down from the boss, like so-and-so had to go, the, the, uh, they would say, all right, I'll give him, I'm going to give this to Andy. Mm -hmm. And then my father, like there was this guy, Carmine Lambendoza. He was a captain with Carlo Gambino. He had a falling out with Gambino. Gambino wanted him killed. So, the order came down to Neil. Neil was the underboss, right? My father took the contract 
because he wanted this two this guy Nikki Le mm. and Lenny to be made. Mm. So he took the contract and gave it to Nikki and Lenny. Right. They never and Carlo Gambino eventually called it off. They were going to kill him. So this guy swam every day. He had a pool, a built-in pool in his yard in Brooklyn, and he swam every day. They were going to actually kill him in this pool mm. when he swam. And uh, what happened was so. They had to check out my father every hour the day that the hit was supposed mm -hmm. to come down. And then Carl called it off at the last minute and they never killed him. And later on, we used to run into Carmine Lamondoza. My father would go, you don't know how lucky he is. <laughs> right, yeah, right. He should only know. <laughs> right. You know, he was going that day. So yeah. it's so funny because That's here wild. you are, you, you took a contract to kill the guy. Yeah. And now- here we are a few years later and like we're drinking and laughing and yeah. hanging out in some club in Brooklyn like nothing ever happened. Meanwhile, five years ago, right. you were going to shoot this guy in the head right. because they asked, you know, you took an order. Right. Now, if that ever happened, could you eventually like, you know, after Gambino died, could you tell, could your father tell Carlo, hey, just so you know, this guy wanted you whacked and we almost did it. Like, would that ever happen? No, that, you can't no. do that. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story. So- my father killed Carlo Gambino's cousin. My father was the hitman on Carlo Gambino. When Carlo, when Albert Anastasia was alive, he didn't like Carl Gambino. And they killed Carl's cousin. My father was on the hit team that killed Carl's cousin. When Carl became the boss, the only one who knew that my father was on the hit team was Arnel De La Croce. Now, if Neil would have told, Carl wanted to know who was on the hit team, but nobody ever told him. If Neil would have told Carl that my father was on the hit team. Carl would have killed my father. Mm. So you just, you know, you, yeah. you don't talk, you know, right. that's a no. Yeah, totally. That makes yeah. sense. Because mm. you're dealing with serious business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your father, you know, he obviously loved you very much, probably had many good qualities, uh, you know, but he's a cold-blooded murderer at the end of the day. Did he ever have ambitions to move up and quit getting his hands so dirty? Because, you know, obviously he's a tremendous earner, which yeah. is what keeps your organization going at the end of the day. It's the money. But it sounds like he never got promoted. Like he never even became captain, right? At the end of his life, he did. When he got out when he got out of prison, he became a captain before he died. Like they, out of respect. Like right. the last time I visited him, he was like acting captain. He was, he got, he... The reason why they always said Capo, because that's how he had so much power and he had so many. Yeah. So he had, and, and, and he was asked to do things over captains, you know, like right. with that situation in Florida. The last time I saw him was in, uh, in, in, and I was in prison when, when he got out in prison, I saw him in um, 1998. I saw him. That was the last time I saw him. He had gotten out, and I was, in, I was in prison. He came to visit me, and he said, they finally made me an official captain, I guess now out of respect, you know, and mm -hmm. he laughed about it. Was he kind of bitter? He was bitter years ago. Not, I mean, he was bitter, but, I mean, he had so much power. I mean, he he was okay. He had so much, you know, juice and he yeah. was so respected, you know. It didn't stop him from earning. No, it didn't, it didn't stop, stop him, from, him from anything. Yeah. I mean, he got respect from, the bosses loved him. I mean, Vicar Musso, who was the boss of the Lucchese family, loved him. Um, everybody liked him. Joe Messina. I mean, he was so well liked. He was so tight with everybody. Mm -hmm. Even John Gotti, you know. I'm good friends with Sammy the Bull. We get, you know, he he's my guy. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I know a lot of people have a lot of bad things to say about mm -hmm. him, but he's good with me. You know, he's good with me. But when John was in MCC in, in, in Manhattan, when Sammy cooperated, I was in prison myself. Um, what were you down for? That time I was down for the policy, the numbers. I got busted uh -huh. for the numbers. When uh, and um, but I didn't know that at the time. So when I went to prison in '96, now I'm in federal prison, and I ran across guys that were in MCC with John when Sammy cooperated because he was in mm -hmm. pop, he was in MCC, and they told me that at John just would made a remarks in MCC that if Fat Andy was home, I wouldn't be in this mess because probably maybe. He might have made my father the underboss. Of course, right. what happened was he needed somebody from that fraction to be underboss, like Frankie DeChico, mm -hmm. who, who set up Paul, who got blown up in the bomb. He needed someone from that fraction to keep the peace. And Sammy 
was the perfect candidate right. for that. He was a gangster. He was a killer. He was smart. He was an earner. And right. he came from that fraction. That right. was his, them guys, Danny Marino and all them guys, that was their crew. Right. My father was well-respected with everybody, mm -hmm. so he would have fit in perfect with right. John. So if your father, think about that twist of fate. So if your father hadn't been locked up in the 80s, he likely would have been underboss to Gotti and unlike Sammy the Bull, would never have opened his mouth when all the heat came down. It's a strong possibility. My father definitely missed the boat, and he knew it. Like yeah. he knew, like Tony Lee was involved. T Tony Lee was involved in everything. Tony Lee actually turned down being a captain, and John oh. got mad. And John used to tell me, "This guy don't want to be a, like Tony Lee. Didn't want to be." We didn't know at the time he had he had cancer. So what happened was, that's how peak. So it's a whole. It's a whole. Crazy thing. So, so my father's in jail. John becomes the boss. Mm. My father is not upset, but he knows he missed the boat. Like, because if he was out, he would have been in on the whole thing, and he definitely would have been elevated to yeah. a, a big position. Yeah, he would have definitely been in on it. Tony Lee is in 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 the mix, but he's not feeling well. John wants to make Tony Lee a captain. Tony Lee tells him, "No, thank you." Mm. John gets mad. This guy don't want to be, not to kill him because Tony knows him since he's a kid. Yeah. He tells me, John, imagine this guy don't want to be a captain. What's wrong with him? I don't, and, and my father now has an argument with Tony Lee in the visiting room. Like, what are you crazy? You got to take it. I don't want to be bothered. Mm. I'm not going to be on call 24 hours a day with this guy. Bah, bah, bah. So John tells my Tony Lee, well, who, who am I? Because now what happened was Angelo was, my father's in jail. Angelo Quack became the first captain. Mm -hmm. He gets shelved because of the tapes. Right. Then, then they make Jeannie Gotti the captain. Who was John's older brother? Younger brother. Younger brother. He gets indicted for heroin. Okay. Now he goes away. Now there's no captain. Now my father's in jail. Now there's no captain. Now he wants to make Tony Lee the captain. Tony Lee says no. <laughs> he tells Tony Lee, well, what do I, who do I give it to? Tony Lee nominates Pete Gotti. That's how Pete, and now he made, so now John made Pete Gotti, his older brother, the captain. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah. I didn't know there was two of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was All right. just a crazy scenario. Yeah. So this is, now we're in the 80s. Your father's gone. Tony Lee's dying. Uh, you've got a Coke problem. Right. But, you know, you've taken a pinch or two. You're on the street again, though. Paul Castellano. Like, I, I want to kind of like, I want to, kind of paint these years because the the end is coming for right. the, the the glorious final era yeah, of the mafia is coming to an end um paul castellano is now the boss obviously Gotti is the the main captain he's got the bergen hunt and fish club in queens they're doing all kinds of stuff selling tons of heroin uh which is actually the reason that <laughs> they killed paul right is because they didn't want the, the tapes they had a wire coming out uh, that would implicate all those guys in dope dealing, which is they, they were not supposed to do. Uh, what was your relationship or how with that whole scene during the 80s, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, were you out on the street earning? Yeah, okay. So my father got it, went away in 84. When he went away in 84, I was going back and forth. So now um, he's uh, he's got all these trials. He's got lawyers in Florida. Somebody had to stay in Florida to handle all this mm -hmm. stuff. I stood So I'm married at the time. I have a son. I'm staying in Florida. The Tony Lee and him, out of the money um, the money we're earning, um, they're giving me a stipend. I'm staying in Florida, to, to, and I'm taking care of my father with his lawyers. I'm meeting with his lawyers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to all his court dates. I'm visiting him on a regular basis because now he's housed in, in, that, in, in Miami. So I'm like sort of like out of the picture in New York, but I'm going back and forth. John, yeah. John's the boss. I'm going back and forth. When I go up to New York, I'm seeing John. I'm going to the Bergen Up Fish Club. I'm going to Richie's Cafe, his brother's cafe. I'm hanging out with Tony Lee. Now I'm starting to get like the drugs, the coke is starting to become an issue mm -hmm. with me. Um, 84, 85, uh, my father gets, then my father got convicted, I think in 86, I'm going back and forth. I'm not really earning any money on my own. That's that I'm getting money from them. Cause I have no, I, I, I I'm yeah, not earning yeah, because right, I'm right. tied up with these trials right. with visiting him. 
but I'm getting my end. I'm getting an right. end from them. You know, and this is the advantage of being a made guy is that when you get in trouble, right? What's supposed to happen is that you get a pension, right? Right, like right. you're getting now, right? Okay, but my father was partners with Tony Lee. They split everything 50-50. Mm -hmm. So now I'm taking care of him down here. I'm going back and forth. 85, he gets convicted. I think in 86, he got convicted. Then he got cancer. He got throat cancer um, of, of the larynx. Mm -hmm. I fly up to New York. John Gotti and my father and Tony give me money for the, for the John Gotti says to me, no none, no friend of mine's gonna die in jail if I could help it. They pay for a private surgeon to remove his voice box. They take out his voice box. He goes to um, Missouri, uh, Springfield, Missouri, actually where John died. He was out there, my father, with Paul Ivario was there. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And they teach him how to talk. Now drugs, I'm, 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 I'm getting more. You After know, your father gets sent off to prison, do you go back to New York now? now that well, you're I didn't go, after he left, Florida, I went back to New York. So he was in That's Florida. what I mean. He was in Florida for three years fighting the cases. Yeah. When he went to Missouri, I went I I went back to, okay. to, to New York. So let's talk about this time because now, you know, this is where Gotti is starting to become infamous. He's right. beaten cases. This is where the documentary comes in. Right. Um, are you involved with the crew? Uh, on Mulberry Street. Yeah. Okay. Are so, you Are you going down there? Yeah. So now what happens is my father goes to Missouri. I go back to New York. I go back to work with the number business. My father. Okay. They still have the ninety thousand a day. So I'm wow. I'm I'm one of the guys running the number business, but I'm still fooling around with the coke. Yeah. I'm seeing John. I'm going to the Raven night. You know. I'm I'm still around. I'm around everybody. I didn't get chased or anything like that. Mm. Um. But I'm I'm working with the number business, but I'm spending I, most of my money's going. I'm buying coke with it, you know. I'm just not I'm just not right in the head. Yeah. Um, then in '88, I, I I decided to go into treatment. Right, like I I just couldn't do it anymore. I sent for Tony Lee. He came to my house and um, I told him, listen, I I, I got I got to go mm -hmm. to treatment. Um, you know, um, and he looked at me. He goes, yeah, you better do something because. Uh, you, I don't know how much more they're going to put up with you. Right. Because now it, I'm taking money off people, you know, right. I'm taking money off guys, you know, mad dog, I'm taking money off Johnny Caniglia, the blood, cold blood and murderers. I'm taking money off them, you know, I'm just doing stupid. Right. Because when you're that far gone off dope, yeah. you become a liability. Yeah. You start yeah. doing well, stupid. You know, but I mean, I had gotten, you know, I got arrested, you know, I got, we had, I got arrested in the chop shop. I mean, I was getting arrested for stuff. They knew I was never going to cooperate at that right. time. So anyway, I, Tony paid for my, I needed him to pay for mm -hmm. the treatment because I had no insurance. He paid for treatment. I went to treatment. I got out of, I got out of the treatment center. And uh, actually I got out of treatment on a Wednesday. And that Saturday I went to see John Gotti with Tony Lee. You know, and I go see him. Not every he always liked me. You know, he always liked me. He always treated me good, even when he knew I was fucked up in the mm -hmm. head. He loved my mother. He loved my ex-wife. He always looked out for me. For some reason, the guy always looked out for me. Mm -hmm. So I go see him on a Saturday, and he takes me outside. Now here's the boss. He takes me outside, and he says, "So what do you think? You got it beat?" So I says, "Well." I'm not going to get high today. I told him, you know, just for today. You <laughs> right. know? He goes, all right. He goes, uh, is there anything I could do for you? You know, I don't want you stressed out. And he left. I didn't have a car. So I said, well, I don't have a car. He goes, you don't have a car. I go, no, I, I don't have a car. He goes, all right. We go back. He goes inside. He had an office. So there was the Bergen Fish Club. And then next door, he had an office where he had his barber chair in the back. He used to get his haircuts every day. So he goes into the office. He comes out, he goes, okay, let Tony take you to 84th Street in Atlanta Avenue. There's a car lot there. Go to, in the car lot and ask for Anthony, this guy Anthony. He's waiting for you. I said, all right. I get in the car with Tony. I go to the car lot. They say, are you Anthony? He goes, yeah. I said, John sent me. He says, take whatever car you want. He tells me. <laughs> I said, Me now I'm looking for a Cadillac, right? I go, right. take whatever <laughs> car I want. So I look at it. So I found, uh, I found a beautiful white four-door Bonneville. Bonnevilles were big back then. So I find this, there's no Cadillac. So I find this beautiful white Bonneville and I take it. I get it. I go back to the Bergen and I show him the car and he goes, okay. And he said, here, here's, here's, Here's two thousand dollars. I go really. He goes, listen. He goes, I want you to come here every Saturday, because he used to eat lunch at the Burger Fish Club every Saturday mm. before he went to the Raven Night. I want you to come here every Saturday with a hundred dollars and don't.
disappoint me. He told me. I said, you got it. I go back the next Saturday with 100. I give him the 100. I go back the second Saturday. I give him 100. I go back the third Saturday. And he tells me, how much you owe me? I said, I owe you 1700 He goes, how you doing? I said, I'm doing, now I'm looking good. Now I'm clean, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm dry, I'm wearing, I'm wearing nice clothes. I'm work, you know, he knows now I'm back at it. I'm in the number business. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm in the street now, you mm -hmm. know, because I was good at, I was good at it. You know what I mean? The only them couple of years that I got messed up with that coke, mm -hmm. but I was good at, I knew that life. I had a good teacher. My father mm -hmm. taught me well. It, I wish he would have taught me how to fix cars, but you yeah, know, he yeah. didn't, you know? So I knew the game. I knew the life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, and they knew that if I was clean, I was good at it. So I was an asset. You yeah, know what I mean? Totally. I would have been an asset. Totally. So he says, all right, listen, keep the 1700 as a gift. And I kept it. And then I started making a lot of money on my, now I'm clean. Yeah. My head's on right. My father got his 40 years. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, where he is. Um, Tony Lee's not feeling well. We don't know at the time. Then we find out he's got stomach cancer. Mm. You know, um, what are you doing now? Now things start to take off. Now things start to take off. Now I have now now um I, I so I I, ex, I took over so I, I extorted a vending company. Now I'm in the street. So I, I there was a, a this guy had a big vending company that was around us. He did something wrong. I chased him. I took over his company. Did you have to beat dudes up? Like, is that how you would well, lean I on a I guy? Didn't beat, what happened was, so this guy had a big vending company, gambling machines and, mm -hmm. and pool tables and jukeboxes. But he he was with us. He was with us. And we would take him, we would just take in an envelope off him every month. He was just like giving us like a, a, like a, a fee yeah. every month. What happened was, so he went behind our backs to these guys in the Genovese family and he was doing business with them. And he was looking to sell the company to them. Someone that worked in his office was like my spy, called me one day and said, listen, Louis is on the route collecting money. Louis was a guy that worked for this crew with the Genovese family. I said, Louis's on the route, on Stevie's route, collect the money. What are you kidding me? I get in a car with this kid, Chris, and I go into Brooklyn and I find this guy on the route. And I jump out of the car and we put my friend, Chris put a knife to his throat and I took the bag of money and I told him, you better stay off this out. What are you kidding me? <laughs> right? So he leaves. I take the keys. And then the Genovese family calls for a sit down. So we go sit down with them in, in Jersey with Mikey Gal, because now Tony Lee, Tony Lee is, is sick. Mm. He's, so I go with Mikey Gal. And I go with this guy, Ronnie one -Arm. He was an otherwise guy, Ronnie one -Arm. He became a captain. He's doing life now. And we go sit down with the Genovese family. And they're putting up a stink that they, they were partners with him. And all this, I couldn't tell you a lying because he, was, he wasn't there, Stevie, because now I had chased him. I took his keys off him and I took over the company. The wind up was, the decision was I had to go partners with the Genovese family. I see. But I, I see. ran the company. So I was part of them, but they had no say in the business. I ran mm -hmm. the business. I just had to give them their end. And I took over the company. And how was that money? Then the Medi Oh my company? God, it was crazy money. So how are you, uh, explain that. Like So we had so we had spots all over the city in like after hour clubs and bodegas and yeah. number holes. We had slot machines, joker poker machines, eight lines. We had, you know, Pac-Mans. We would, you know, we had Insane. everything. I mean, we it's were just, making 20, 20 30,000 a week cash. Like right. it's crazy. And it's so, passive. It's right. just people putting and you their got money 50%, in. Like, you know, yeah. so the, the owner got 50%, you got 50%. And I had a, you know, I had a guy working the route yeah. and all I did was, all you do is plug it in and collect money. It's crazy. I had a service guy that fixed the machines. I had a warehouse. I had a truck, you know, yeah. I had a van, two vans. And I started making a lot of money with that. Then I had a credit card business. I had a, I had a guy in the post office, we were getting credit cards. I had I had a I had a major major credit card thing going, like um, dupe credit cards, like may, even real credit. I had I had a guy in the post office that was giving us credit cards right from the post office stacks like that. I had crews, so like this was my. I'll give you a for instance. This was my morning, my morning. This was my morning. Yeah, what's a typical morning? Okay, this was a look like so for let's a mob go, guy. Let's say let's say it's nineteen. Let's go nineteen ninety. Okay, ninety. Well, I was in jail in ninety one. I got out of ninety two. So ninety, ninety, the end of ninety two, ninety three. This was my day. 
I'd get up, I go out. So there's a bakery in my neighborhood. Where are you, you living? I was living in, in I was living in, in in Lindenwood, Long Island, and Ozone Park. Got it. I was married. I was living in Lindenwood. I had a triplex condo. So I'd wake up and there was a, a bakery in my neighborhood. I would go to the and they they made breakfasts to old ladies. I would go there with my New York Post and my New York Daily News. I'd get my uh, my egg sandwich and my coffee, and I'd sit, and my and then everybody would start coming. My partner Frankie would come, and my cousin, my my other this other kid Frankie would come, and so Frankie, my partner Frankie ran the credit card scheme. My Frankie, the mechanic, he ran the chop. We had chop shops. We had a stolen car ring. We had chop shops. This other guy would come. He worked in the number business, and then we would send crews out. So all right, today. We'd have a van with credit cards. They're going out to Jersey to bang out credit cards. Then we'd have a crew that's going to chop the cars. They'd go. We had two chop shops. They'd go to the chop shops and chop the stolen cars and bring the parts to the junkyard. Then I had the vending company. Who? All right, we got to We need five slot machines for this spot. We need three slot machines for that spot. Then I would get. We would buy in jewelry with the credit cards. Then I would take all the jewelry. I have someone bring that to the guy that's buying all the jewelry. Every penny I made was illegal. Yeah. Every penny. And envelopes are coming to you. Every money's coming in all, all every day. Place. I'm being followed every day by mm -hmm. the cop. Like, it was just, uh, you know. And how much were you kicking up? Because you're you're not made. So who are you? You're just an associate. Well, who are you kicking upstairs okay, to so in the I, family? I'm proposed at the time. Okay. Right? My father is still alive. He's still the boss of the crew. So after Tony, well, Tony Lee never would take money off me. Mm. So I wasn't really kicking up to anybody wow. because you got to understand, Tony Lee was my godfather. Right. And Fat Andy's my father. Right. So they're not going to take money off me, but don't, I mean, right. but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff for them. You know what I mean? Like I'm doing, we'll make right. money together, right. but I'm not kicking up anything right. to them. I'm not giving them an envelope like other people that were with them. Right. I mean, guys around me were kick, giving them money, like, you know, what, yeah. what, but I wasn't personally giving them money. Because it's supposed to, it's supposed to go. the The chain of money is supposed to go from the street to the associate right. who's taking it off the street to the, to soldier, the soldier to the captain, to the captain to the up to the boss. Right, that's how it goes. But they weren't, you know, they they weren't taking no money off me. Tony used to break my balls because when he found out how much money I was making, because he never, you know, I he never when he found out I was making a lot of money, he used to break my balls. Like I didn't know you were making that much money, you dirty son of a bitch. Uh, he would tease me, but I said, "You want money off me?" Like because he he loved me. He was like my yeah. second father. You know, when I split up with my first wife. I lived with him. Oh, okay. You know? So he was a so and so you know he when he he actually when I I lived with him when he got arrested with John Gotti on the Carpenter case when they shot the Carpenter Union president in the ass, um, and he would tell me I would come out and he would tell you know what today's date is no why it's the first of the month he's tell me you know what has to get done on the first of the month I said what because you got to pay the rent I said you want rent for me I said if if. If you, if your son lived with my, he didn't have a son. So if you had a son and he lived with my father, you would think he would take rent off him? You want rent from me? And he's just stare at me. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, so the money is rolling in. It's all illegal. It's and, crazy. And they must, Tony must have been, and your father must have been proud of you. Yeah, then it's, they were. Oh, they will. They, you know, now, but now I'm, I'm, I'm in. Like I, I'm, I got proposed. You know, my father befriends uh, uh, Joey Molina. He's the boss of Philadelphia, you know, he, yeah. uh, and I'm bringing messages to, um, you know, like uh, the Gambino, like Nikki, they're sending me to Philadelphia to meet with this guy, bringing messages to him. You know, I'm, I'm doing business with, you know, I have friends in every family, mm -hmm. like, you know, like it, it was just, yeah, no, I was doing great. I was, can, you know, I, I had the respect back and everything was going good. Can I ask you this? How long does one normally, when they get proposed, how long do you normally have to stay in that, like, proposal period before you actually get straightened out? It all depends. I mean, you know, it could be a day, it could be a year. You know what I mean? Like for me, so what happened was the first time I got proposed was every time I got proposed and I was supposed to get made, I went to prison. It's so crazy. So the right. first time I got proposed was in the nineties. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get proposed. My father's still alive. Tony had just died. Um, and I'm waiting for the ceremony. I get arrested. I get arrested. I get I, I get arrested. Um, I got proposed in like 94, like that. I get arrested in December of 95. I, I proposed. My name went around. Everything's good. 
I have to go to jail. I get arrested. I get I take I get arrested for bookmaking. That's legal now. Right. I get arrested. I cop out. I get a two to four. This in the state. In New York State, right by the Queens Organized Crime Task Force. I get arrested on a joint task force. Brooklyn and Queens was a whole big bookmaking ring thing. Mm. I get arrested and um, I take a plea. I get two to four. They have a going away party and Skinny Dom who was a captain in the Cambino family, takes me outside and he says, listen, soon as you come out, you'll get straightened out. We'll have the ceremony. You'll get made. Mm. I said, all right. I go, I go, I turn myself in. I get two to four. While I'm in there, I get indicted in Miami by the feds Oof. with Nikki Carrazza on a whole big Rico case, uh, murder conspiracy. And I get indicted in, in Florida. I get taken down to Florida by the marshals and I get 10 more years. Oh, my God. If I take a plea, I get 10 years. And what year is that that you took the plea? I took the plea in 97. Okay. January of 97. No, January of 98. I'm sorry. I took the plea. I got I got, an, I got indicted in the beginning of 97. They took me to Florida. I stood in Florida for a year. And then I, and then I went back to New York State because I had to finish my state time. So now I wind up doing eight years and three months. While I was in prison, my father died. Oh, I'm so my sorry. My father died. My father got out. A prison in 97, and in 97, he died in 99. When my father got out of prison, the guys that were around, I was around then, Skinny Domino, they, they, fucked, they fucked me over. They didn't do the right thing because it was a different world then. They right. took everything. They stopped giving my mother money. It was just uh -huh. a whole big thing. So did you miss, were you already locked up when your father came home? Yeah, I was in prison. So you yeah. never saw your father's, two free men since, you know, the mid eighties. No, I never had dinner. After 1984, I haven't, I haven't you had never... dinner with my father from 1984. Eight, 1984 was the last time I had a dinner with my father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I That's painful. Yeah, I never saw him. He was either in prison or I was in prison or we were both in prison. So uh, while after he died, what happened was um, I had a falling out with the guys that were left. They did the wrong thing. They mm -hmm. took money off me. They just mm -hmm. didn't do the right thing. We need to back up now because yeah, this is a key part of the story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we go back to the 80s, around the time that you go up to Vermont to get clean. Oh, how'd you know I went to Vermont? I just, I got my sources, <laughs> that's you know. Good. That, I got that, my I little like snitches. That. Good research. So yeah. when- it's Found this hole. <laughs> that's right. That's right. A way up there yeah. uh, to dry out from your Coke problem. Uh, it gets messy. Your sister is gets married to a scumbag. Uh, he's, I don't know if he, he's, he's not made, he's not a wise guy, but he's a criminal. Very dangerous. Armed yeah. robber. An armed robber. Was he a junkie himself? Well, he became a drug, he became, he, he, when well, he had a drug problem. So my sister met this guy, my sister meets this guy. He was an armored truck robber. He's hanging out with this guy. He's partnered with this guy, Peter Sakara. They're dangerous kids. They're mobbed up. They're dangerous kids. She she uh, uh, she meets this guy, um, and she starts staying him. And actually, uh, another captain in the Gambino film named Danny Marino comes to see us, me and Tony Lee, and he tells us, listen, your sister's got to stay away from this guy. He's no good. He's dangerous. He already was involved with my niece and mm -hmm. he took money off her and a whole big thing. But of course, my mother and my sister, they didn't want to listen and my sister continued going out with him. Um, and he was a dangerous kid. He was a killer. I mean, they were dangerous kids. Him and his partner, they were just, they were dangerous. They did a bid for armored truck robbery. Yeah. Um, did he ever abuse your sister that you well, know? Well, I mean, he, he, he would get high and smoke crack or whatever and he would get paranoid and yeah. he would rip her shirt off. I mean, he he would, he was dangerous. He was dangerous. He certainly probably would have. Yeah. If but he should have just stood away from my sister. He knew she was Fat Andy's daughter. Yeah. His friends told him, his own friends told him to stay away from her. Right. But for some reason he didn't um, and he should have. Did you ever tell him, did you ever approach him and say, look, stay away from my sister? Or were you too strung no, out at the well, time? No, I wasn't strung out, but I wasn't really paying attention when I. So she met him right before I got clean. So when she first met him, I wasn't really paying attention. I was in my own, my own self-centered world. Mm. I wasn't really paying attention. He was more or less hanging out with my brother. My brother Albert was more or less hanging out with him, and I wasn't hanging out with them. So I, I, I just wasn't paying attention. Um, 
I had a couple of arguments with him. He robbed a friend of mine, robbed his house, you know, this coke dealer friend of mine. He robbed. So I, I had some arguments with him. I had some beefs with him, but I never told him, stay away from my sister. I just had some beefs with him. When I went to treatment, he hit my mother. He attacked my mother. And that was the beginning of the end. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, everybody, when they hear about, you know, citizens, taxpayers, myself, if you could imagine somebody choking and hitting our sweet mother, mm. we want to kill him. It's the first mm. thing we yeah. think was we wish we could take him out. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're mobbed up, that can become a reality. Right. Why don't you walk us through it? Why don't you walk us through how he uh, disappeared? So what happened was, so I'm in treatment and um, they had a baby shower for my sister and I call up the next day to find out how everything went and my, my wife at the time, Alice, tells me what happened. He goes, yeah, I came home and I heard screaming. I went down. He was choking your mother over the spa tab that he ran up and, mm -hmm. and uh, she jumped on him. She scratched his face. The whole big thing transpired. I go, all right, now I'm in treatment. I didn't want to leave. I still had to finish what I had to finish. So I get out of treatment and I go see Tony Lee because my father's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, this guy put his hands on my mother. And Tony said, I know. Mm. I said, you know, what do you mean, you know? I said, so what, 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 what are we doing? What are we going to do here? And he goes, we're going to clip him. Mm. Just like that. Yeah. And I said, all right. You know, and, I, and I, I said, yeah. So, and, and he goes, but you know, your father has to okay it first. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right. <laughs> so I had to go visit my father. Now this is the mob. Like here, now I'm, I'm your son yeah. and I'm coming to you now to ask you permit, give me permission to go commit a murder. Right. Like, you know, like right. it's like, you know, father son conversation. You right. Know? Like I'm asking you how to fix a flat, you know? Right. So I go visit my father. And where is he now? He's in prison. He's what in what facility? He's in Virginia. Okay. He's in Petersburg, Virginia. I go drive to Virginia. I go visit him and I tell him what happened. And the first words out of his mouth, this is what this is how mob guys are egomaniacs. The first words out of his mouth was, What does this guy think? I'm dead? <laughs> right. Like he made it all about him. Or, you know, yeah. like, like how could he disrespect me? Yeah, how could he disrespect me? He choked your wife, almost killed my mother. Right. And how, what does he think? I'm dead? Yeah. You know, right. like, right. Um, so he okays it. It which, seems like an easy sell. Yeah, yeah. Which but also, I, you know, he's now getting his son into the murder right, game. So, I mean, now, in, now, in hindsight, I wish he wouldn't have okayed it, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, it was a horrible thing we did. You know, um, my sister and my niece still hate me, which I don't blame them. Um, so anyway, I, I go back to New York and I tell Tony Lee he okayed it. Now we're going to put it on record because we have to get permission. We're not just going to do something like that. So we sent for Jeannie Gotti. Okay. He was the captain at the time. We sent for Jeannie Gotti. And um, we, he tell, now they loved my mother. Mm -hmm. Jeannie and John Gotti yeah. loved my mother. And we tell him what happened. And he goes, all right. He goes back, comes back a couple of days later. He goes, oh, John okayed it. John is the boy. John okayed it. And then we put, the, then we put it in motion. So the uh, hit, even though this guy... This guy that's married to your sister, he's not in any way made, straightened out. He's mobbed up, but he's just, he's a criminal. That hit still has to go up to John, the boss. It still has to be okayed, even though it's not beef between two members of the family. Just from you being associated with the Gambinos, if you want to murder somebody, it, it's got to be approved by the boss. You can, any murder has to be approved. You just can't randomly kill people because that brings heat. Violence yeah. brings heat. Right. When the feds know you committed an act of violence, like that act of violence I committed, yeah. the feds hunted me down right. from the day that happened. Once they know you committed an act of violence and you get put on that list, by the, mm -hmm. you're, you're finished. Did your father, uh, when you went to visit him, you know, obviously it's not through the phone. You're it, talking to him in the visiting room face to face. Did he tell you to make him disappear? Did no. he give you any advice on we how to actually do about, it? We didn't talk about anything like that. We okay. just told him, you know, we just asked for permission. And then I went back and I said, he said, yes. Then we got permission from John. We didn't have a plan up to that point. Okay. We didn't have a, a, a way or where or how or what, okay. you know, it was yeah. just, let's get permission. Mm -hmm. And then once we got permission, then we put a plan in place. Okay. And then, so you 
Uh, who were the the other two people involved? What were their names? What do you mean? Who was the, the two involved in the hit? The, the, the well, trigger the day man. of the hit, it was uh, me. Uh, the day of the hit, I picked them up. Yeah. I had the hardest job, really, because I had to pick them up and bring them there. So I picked them up and uh, I brought them to Cafe Liberty. Mikey Gal, Tony Lee's brother, he was a main member. He was waiting outside, sitting in a chair. Inside the c club was this guy, Freddie Hot, who was a made guy, Skinny Dom, who was, what, no, they weren't made yet. Freddie and Skinny Dom were proposed. And Tony Lee was inside the club. I pulled up and um, we got out of the car. Me and him, Mikey Gal walked up, kissed us both hello. Mm -hmm. And we walked in, and when we walked in, Frankie walked in ahead of me. I wasn't nervous at all up to that point. And then Frankie walked in ahead of me. And when I walked in, I heard Mikey, because you could lock the door from the outside. Mm. And I heard the door lock behind me. When I heard the door lock behind me, I got a little nervous. And I walked in, and they had bagels and coffee on the bar. And we walked in, and I made myself a bagel, and I was eating the bagel. And then Tony Lee told Frankie and me, come in the back, I'll show you the garden. He had a garden in the back. And uh, we walked out into the garden, and he picked tomatoes and cucumbers, and he put them in a the bag, and he gave the bag to Frankie to take mm -hmm. home with him. And then we, we walked back out of the garden, and Tony Lee just grabbed Frankie's hand because we made out he was coming there to hear about a score because Tony Lee right. had a score for him. And Tony Lee grabbed his hand and said, wait, I want to talk to you. And I just kept on walking. And mm. when I walked, I gave the nod to Dominic and Dominic took the pistol out and went in the back and shot him. Yeah. And Skinny Dom was the trigger man. Right. Right. So shot him. Then you guys waited till it was dark. Well, I left. They shot him. Tony Lee came out of the back room and said, okay, I had to go to the number office that day. Right. I, we had the number business. Mm -hmm. So he said, I go to the number office, you know, make out nothing happened. Nobody, mm -hmm. you know, I, went, I, I got in my car and I left. I went to the number office. They took the body and put it in the trunk of Skinny Dom's car and they parked it in Skinny Dom's alleyway overnight mm -hmm. and then the next day they took him on a boat and they you know put him in the ocean put yeah. him in the atlantic ocean right type put weights yeah, on they him put weights on him and they put him in the Stab, ocean opened his belly opened up opened up his lungs and they yeah. put him in the ocean and then uh, and um that was it yeah you know and then um yeah nice. and there was so so he goes missing mm. obviously you know your sister's distraught she suspects you but yeah. but it, it looks like a clean crime. It looks like yeah, yeah, it, you no, know, there's no body, there's no case. No, but they 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 suspected us, but they didn't. I mean, they were in denial. His father kept coming around, and his friend Peter kept coming around, yeah. and then they stopped coming around. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a bad situation. I mean, I actually went looking for him with his own father. I mean, you know, it just was a crazy Oof. way to live. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I am. I'm in the car with this poor guy looking for his son when I know yeah. we already we just killed the kid. You it's know? almost better. It's almost more dignified or merciful to the family to just shoot him in the head and leave him on the street because yeah, at least you know, there's who, some closure. We, we figured. We figured. You know, nobody. You know, no body, no crime. Yeah. But the, that's the mafia. So here, here, here we are. Here is father and son. We commit a murder together. Yeah. Now my sister meets another guy after this. Okay. Now she goes through her the grieving process and everything, and she meets this guy named Chris. Now Chris isn't mobbed up like Frankie. Chris is just a kid from the neighborhood, mm -hmm. fooling around with drugs, stealing cars. You know, not mobbed up. Don't know a wise guy from a hole in the wall. Like just right. a neighborhood kid, right. dumb neighborhood <laughs> kid. The Ruggiano women yeah, really yeah, know yeah, how to oh, pick them. Yeah, yeah, bad pickers. <laughs> so now my sister hooks up with this kid. They get arrested in a stolen car with credit cards. This kid has credit cards. He's driving in a stolen car. They get arrested. My sister gets out. Now my father, come see me. I go see him. I'm in the visiting room. I tell him what happened. She got arrested. This kid, Chris, he had a stolen car. Bah, 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 bah. He looks at me and he says to me, you know what you got to do here, right? So I looked at him. I go, I know what I got to do here. I said, what, are you kidding me? He goes, no. He goes, you know what you got to do here, right? I go, yeah, you know what we'll do? I said, this is what we'll do. I said, we'll kill everybody she goes with until she meets an astronaut. <laughs> so now he gets mad. He goes, oh, yeah, forget it. 
I'll take care of it myself. I don't want you to do nothing for me. He wanted me to kill this kid, wow. Chris. I said, he says, forget it. He goes, I'll take care of it myself. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to do nothing. I'll take care of it. I said, good, you take care of it because I'm not doing that. Yeah. I said, this, right? Now I leave the visit. I go back to there and I sent for this kid, Chris. I tell him, listen, you better get the f out of here because you're going. Yeah. Wow. Right? I tell him, you, and the reason now, this is the, so Frankie, I'm sorry I did what I did. Frankie was mobbed up. Frankie knew the deal. Anybody, so my th thing is this, you know, you know the deal. You're mobbed up. You know what happens. You know the rules. You break the rules. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get killed. Yeah. Frankie knew the rules. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not that I'm justifying what happened to him. Right. But he knew the rules. Yeah. Chris did not know. The, Chris was just right. a neighborhood He's kid, a civilian. A civilian. More or less. Little kid fooling around with drugs, stole a car, what kids do. Teenage. Yeah. That's what people do in their 20s, whatever. Yeah. So I, he ran away. Mm -hmm. The kid. He, he leaves. He runs away. Now I don't see the kid. Now I don't know. If he's dead, if he's alive, I'm not even asking. I don't even want to know. Right. Like when I'm visiting my father, I don't want to know. Right. Like I don't, it's a dead issue. Right. About two years later, I get a letter from this kid in jail that I know, this kid, Chris. And he goes, hey, listen, there's this Chris Christoph, another kid, Chris. He goes, hey, listen, there's this kid, Chris, that just hit the yard. He said he used to date your sister. Do you know him? And I go, oh, thank God he's alive. Yeah. I said, so I send back and I go, yeah, he's all right, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and they took care of him. But you know, but the reason why I didn't kill him was because he wasn't mobbed up. Yeah, like, he didn't deserve so it. So now if he was mobbed up and he knew the deal, maybe I would have had a different reaction. Right. right. You know what I mean? But but uh, but that's you know, so here we are. Father and son were arguing over, like, because mm -hmm. I don't want to murder somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the crazy, how crazy that life is. Yeah. But yeah. we think that's normal. We thought, like, we thought it was normal. Like, my father used to tell me, don't ever feel sorry for, for don't ever feel sorry for, for, um, for the general, don't ever feel sorry for the public, he used to tell me. Mm. He goes, don't ever, and I used to tell him why. He goes, because they deserve every f they get for voting for these people. <laughs> Like his theory was the government was the mafia. Right. Like he, he said, listen to me. He, he told me one day, we were, this, we were watching a show one day about the founding fathers. Mm. So he tells me founding fathers. He goes, let me tell you what happened. He goes, one day in Philadelphia, they were in this pub, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and all of them, and they're drinking beer. And one of them said to the other one, hey, why are we sending this English bastard all this money when we could keep it for ourselves? And they started a fucking revolution, he said. And then they wrote the book on treachery, he told me. Right. Yeah. That was his theory. Like he hated the government. They yeah. hate the government. Yeah. He was yeah. he was an old school Italian guy that didn't really feel allegiance to America as much as he did to his own neighborhood. Yeah. Like that's an old school and his people, Italian Americans. He had no allegiance to the United States. Right. They were, they hated the government. Yeah. They hated law enforcement. Yeah. They hated it. And, because and because that, they but, were discriminated against but you gotta for understand many years. Too, they, they, you got to understand, people don't understand that. At one time, everybody was corrupt. Yeah. If there wasn't, if there wasn't corruption, the mafia would have never became what they became. Right. I mean, who believed believe prohibition wasn't a corrupt act? I mean, they knew who was going to make all the money. I yeah. mean, Kennedy was a bootlegger. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, so there was always corruption. Right. And the mob guys knew about it. Like Roosevelt, the great Roosevelt president, went to the mob when he was the governor of New York, went to the mob to become to win the, to get the votes in New York to become president. That's right. They knew there was they know there's corruption. They knew that all would, would you know and that's why they hated them because they used the power against the people that helped him. Kennedy got Kennedy gets murdered. That's right. Why? He double crossed everybody yeah. that helped him. The mob makes this guy president and then he makes his brother attorney general. Yeah. And who does he go after? Hoffa. That's right. <laughs> Turns I mean, around and comes after right. So of course they hated the yeah. government. I mean, yeah. listen, that's why the judge, when the judge sentenced my father, he said, You've been disrespecting this country since you've been 18, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, well, um, certainly your father was always a rebel against organization. You know what I mean? Or against, yeah. you know, anybody that wanted to tell him what to do. He yeah. didn't have a father when he was growing up. Never. He was a street guy. Um, he was kind of indoctrinated from a young age and there was just no changing him. You know no. what I mean? 
I mean, once he got made, he he took orders. I mean, he always, the boss is in that life, and he told me this many times and told me, the boss is the boss is the boss. Yeah. You can't fight an army. Like he used to tell me all the time, if I ever get murdered, if I ever get left in the street or I disappear, forget about it. Don't open <laughs> your mouth. Don't say nothing. You can't fight an army. Mm. He said, he said, just go about your business. He goes, yeah. if they leave me in the street or I disappear, forget about it. And 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 I know I saw it happen to a guy, a guy's son, this guy Patty Mack. He was a captain in the Genovese family. He got murdered. And his son was a knock around kid like me, you know, mm -hmm. in the street. Yeah. And a month later, he was in a bar and a guy walked in and shot him in the head. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that's the life. So it looks like you get away with this body. Right. Uh, time goes on. You're making money. Uh, it's, we're in the 90s now. What, how did you feel the change when Gotti finally takes his fall? And goes away. Uh, How did I, your life change? How did the structure, the organization of the wise guys, the families, the Gambinos in New York change? So, what, so I'm I'm away. I go away in '91. I'm in jail doing a, a, a one and a third to four for the numbers. Mm -hmm. that I took a plea while I'm in jail. Well, John got arrested right before I went to jail, so he's in, he's in MCC. Sammy didn't cooperate yet. They're away. You know, um, the family's still operating. We're still, I'm still, everybody's still operating. I go, I go away in 91. While I'm away, Sammy flips. Yeah. Sammy flips um, and John gets convicted. I get out of jail in 92 um, and I'm making crazy money. Yeah. I'm doing great. John's in jail, but I'm making big money. I got the vending company. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm making crazy money. Uh, my father's still alive. Tony passes away in 93, but now they have a, they, they create a panel to run the family. Oh, right? interesting. It's three, a three-man panel. It's John Gotti Jr., John's son, yeah. his brother Pete Gotti, and Nicky Carraza. Now, Nicky Carraza was straight made by my father. He was my father's main guy. Right. Going back to, mm -hmm. all right, from when he was a kid. Right. He's, he's a captain now, a lot of power. He's on the panel. Now, I, I'm, I'm in. Um, you know, right. I'm now I'm in Flo he's going to Florida. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Florida with him. I'm I'm hanging out with him. He's like he's the street boss right. now of the family. Okay. So okay. I'm in. I see. So when Gotti Gotti's still the boss when he goes to prison, but instead of an underboss, the Gambino make they, they make this panel. panel. Right. It's okay. three member panel. I see. And they're running the family. And Nikki is like the prominent member on the panel. Right. People believe it was John Gotti's son, but Nikki was Nikki had had a lot of power, right. very very dangerous, intelligent, a gangster. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a fat Andy uh, prodigy. You know what right. I mean? Like, so uh, so I, so I'm hanging out with him. We're going to Florida together, ninety three, ninety four, ninety five. We're going to Florida. Then in ninety, and then in ninety five, I get arrested for bookmaking right. in New York. Nikki's on the panel. He's still running the show and everything, and then. I get indicted with Nikki mm -hmm. in Florida on a case in Florida by the feds. And then uh, that's when things changed. Up to that point, nothing really changed for me, even though John was in prison because Nikki was on the panel. Right. So I had an, uh, you know. So you had so, an in. Right. I had an in. I was making a lot of money. How, did the rackets change at all? Because in the 90s, you know, technology really started to Whoa. accelerate. What, did you see any new opportunities come in to make money or did any old Rackets kind of fade away. Well, it's the yeah things started happening because they started putting fiber optic cameras in in a lot of places. Right. So like the credit card game was changed. Like things were changing. You know, the casinos were all opened up. The dice games were are gone. Right. Um. The number business, the lottery was picking up steam. Mm -hmm. So things were starting to change. A lot of people started getting into stocks. You know. You know stuff like that. Like, honestly. The way I made money, I couldn't make, I could never do what I did. I could never do what I did then today. Right. Impossible. You didn't go white collar. No, that, I, I, I didn't go white collar because I went to prison. Right. When the people were going white collar, I was in jail. Do you think those are the only guys that actually survived the technological revolution is the guys that went from street to, to white collar? Yeah, more so than us because we were in the street. Like today, I don't even know what mob guys, how to make, how to make money outside of like we talked about earlier. They're still shy lack of money. Yeah. You know, are they extorting anybody today? I mean, everybody goes to the law. Today. Everybody, everybody goes to the law. Yeah, I mean- 
I don't know how they make money today. Bookmaking, everything's online. I mean, to be a bookmaker in my day, you know what you had to go through to be a bookmaker? You had to rent apartments. You had to get yeah. phones. You had to get special paper. Today, yeah. all you do is get an app. Right. Even <laughs> illegally, they have bookmakers that I, that I had an illegal bookmaker. He had a website. Right. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. No, kids are selling drugs online now. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's wild. Marijuana is legal. I got in an Uber yesterday. It stunk of weed. <laughs> right. In LA, I got in a fucking Uber. It stunk a weed. Yeah. Like I don't want to smell that shit. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I. It's. It's pretty. I don't know either. I think it's pretty mom and pop. Yeah. But we'll talk about that at yeah. the very end. But, uh, I so, wonder so now Nikki's on the panel. You know, I'm doing still good, and then I then I get arrested in '95, and then I go away in '96. Okay. What Nikki? Nikki Carraza goes away. We all go away. And Look. that's when you got pinched on the Rico, the the federal Flo beef, right? For if, ten years, right? That's when I got with Nikki and all of them. I got indicted in Miami with them, and I went and we, so we all go away. That's when things change. Now when I I go away, my father dies. I'm sort of disillusioned with that life. Mm -hmm. I get out in 04. Okay. When I get out in 04, this guy Nunzi, who got straightened out when I was away, sends for me. He sends for me. I meet him on Metropolitan Avenue, and he tells me, listen, you're with Nikki now, officially with Nikki now, um, and he puts your name back in to get straightened out. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm on the fence, but I don't tell him that. Like, I want to get straightened out, but I don't want to get straightened out. You know what I mean? Because now my father's dead. Uh, John Gotti's dead. Tony Lee's dead. They fucked me when I was in jail. But so I said, okay. He goes, until... From now, until then, I'm going to, Nikki wants me to service you. I said, mm -hmm. fine, but I'm going to work. Tell Nikki, I'm not going on any meetings. I'm not meeting with any, you know, I, 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 I'm on supervised release. He goes, yeah. yeah, no problem. So I start meeting with Nunzi every once in a while. We go for dinner and everything. Then they sent for me. The three of them, three guys sent for me. They take me to this restaurant called Alberto's. It's an Italian restaurant. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's. Nunzi, he's a wise guy. This guy, brother, he's a wise guy. And this guy, Jimmy Boy, he's a captain. Mm -hmm. And they sent for me. And, we, and it's the four of us. And we're eating in this restaurant, Alberto's. And they start telling me, because now I'm proposed again. And they start telling me about who's who. Because they got to tell you who's the official captain. Right. And they give me the rundown of everything about who's an official captain. And mm -hmm. who's going to drive me to the ceremony and all this. And we're talking, right? Fine, I eat dinner. They tell me all this stuff. Who, this guy's an official captain now. This guy's with this guy. And they're giving me the rundown, mm -hmm. the lay of the land, because I just got out of jail not long ago. And you're 50 years old, yeah. practically. No, I'm over 50. I'm and, 52. And and, yeah. you're and I have my first legitimate job I'll have. You know, oh, right. So yeah. what are you working uh, well, while you're on parole? First, I was working for my father-in-law in his tuxedo store until the FBI decided to come there one day Jeez. to break my balls. So he fired me. Oh my God. <laughs> then I got a job driving a truck, which I loved. I'm driving a truck for this company called Island Acoustics. I'm driving a truck to construction sites, dropping off gang boxes, you know, to start construction. And I loved it. I loved this job, right? Um, I'm going to Manhattan every day with this truck. I never drove a truck in my life. Right. Like, Self-taught. And uh, so, so does I'm, part of you say, I, I just want to get out of criminality? Well, you know, my ego... I always want, listen, I wanted to get made since I'm 16. Right. You know, and I still have that thing that I got to respect my father's mm -hmm. wishes. So part of me, and I, and, I, and I didn't want anybody to catch a delusion on me because they're still dangerous. And I, they know I know a lot of mm -hmm. So I don't want to, and they knew, they knew I loved that life. So now if I tell them I don't want to get made, like, why does this kid want to get right. made? You know, or, yeah. So anyway, so now I have this meeting in Alberto's. We talk about, they tell me what they're going to talk about, and I leave. And I don't know, about two months later, this guy, Lenny Di Maria, sends for me. He's a captain. He's Nikki's partner. Because mm -hmm. now we have to be careful because we're all on supervised release. I really, really can't be seen with Nikki or Father. Right. Well, he's being, you know, because we'll get violated. So this guy, Lenny Di Maria, sends for me. I go meet him, and he goes, okay, listen. We, you, everything's approved. Your name was passed around. All the families approved it. As of today, you have permission to go on sit downs. You're going to be recognized as a wise guy. You don't need Nunzi no more to represent you. All that we're waiting for is to have the ceremony. It could be a next week, a month. We don't have the date yet, but it's all done. 
So if you have to do anything, you know, you could go on your own. Everybody knows. Wow. I say, fine. And I leave. A week later, I'm sitting in front of my son's house on a bench like this with my cell phone. I'm sitting like this on the bench. The sun's shining. The birds are chirping. I'm sitting on the bench. And all of a sudden I hear, don't move you. And I open up my eyes and there's a gun right in my nose. And I'm and all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm getting pulled up off this bench. I'm handcuffed. They dragged me. They threw me in the back of this van and they're screaming at me, you murderer. We got you now. We got you now. And I'm FBI agents. And now I'm in this van. It was like I was drowning. My whole life flashed in front of my face. And I got arrested for a murder. For the for a Rico with a murder. I get arrested for the murder. Which murder? My brother-in-law. I get arrested for my murder with my brother-in-law. Where did their evidence come from? Okay. So what happened was a couple of people throughout the years started cooperating with the government. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law's partner, Peter Sakara, he was the main guy. He cooperated. So what happened was after Frankie disappeared, this guy, Peter Sakara, he was a very dangerous guy. He kept coming around to Cafe Liberty asking about Frankie to the point where Tony Lee told him to stay the away from us. We don't know where he is. We don't mm -hmm. give a fuck where he is. Stay away from us. But he had a premise. He knew. He knew. So he finally, and then I'm standing outside one day and he comes back again. And he parks his car across the street and he walks across the street and I tell him, didn't Tony tell you to stay the fuck out of here? He goes, well, I really want to know what happened to Frankie. So now I told him, I looked at him, I go, I don't know what happened to Frankie, but I'm gonna, I wanna, I'm gonna ask you a question. If someone did something to your mother, what would you do? And he just looked at me and he went, "All right, I understand." And he left. That's an admission of guilt on my part. And they were able to use Wait, that. That's part of what they used. So then they used that. They could use hearsay evidence. The government could use hearsay. The feds, federal government, federal. Law states they could use his TSA government, TSA evidence. Yeah. So he cooperated. Then this other guy, Robert, cooperated. My brother in law cooperated. My brother in law, my first wife's brother, Louis, cooperated. He was the cooperator on my case with Nikki. So they got a little bit of information here, a little bit of information here, a little bit of information here. And they were uh, they were able to, to indict me for the murder. Just you? No, they indicted and Dominic. Now, I don't know how. So somebody. Skinny dog on the trigger right, man. Right. So someone. Someone that I don't know to this day gave them serious information because for Dominic, for them to know Dominic was there, somebody had to say something. There was some, somebody involved in the inner circle gave them information. Right. Somebody did something. So him and I got indicted for the murder. So it's just you two. Right. We got that, indicted. That's unbelievable. Well, I got to say, this is what happened. But to back up a minute, about, a, about a, a two weeks before I got arrested, I got sent for by a mob lawyer, this guy, Joseph Joe Carraza, who was Jojo Carraza's son, who Jojo Carraza was the counselor of the Gambino family. Okay. He was another guy that my father strained out. He was Nikki's brother, Nikki and Jojo. Okay. He sends for me. He goes, listen, we got... What now, Dominic is already indicted for the murder. Dominic's already locked up. I see. He gets worried. He goes, listen, we, got, we, got, we just got worried that there's someone else is going to get indicted on Dominic's case. We don't know if it's you, John Gotti Jr., or Ronnie One Arm, but we know it's one of one of you's three. Why would it have been those other two people? Because they did crimes with them. They did because of the Uvas, the murder on Christmas Eve of the Bonnie and Clyde team, right? That which was, we didn't get into. Right, that was Robin Crap, uh, Robin Social Clubs. Dominic was one of the shooters, and Skinny Dom. Dominic and Skinny Dom were the two shooters. And Junior is the one that put it all together. Okay. So just just to keep the story moving right. for the people at home that didn't really understand, there were uh, a couple of junkies, a couple, a man and a woman uh, from the neighborhood who were robbing mob, mob social, clubs. social clubs. They were sticking them up. Right. Uh, and so on Christmas Eve of what year? I don't remember the year. I was in jail when it happened. Okay. So probably the be, late 80s, early be, 90s. It had, to be in, it had to be between 91 and 92. Yeah. So on Christmas Eve, outside of a chapel in Ozone. church, Nativity Church. In, in Ozone Park, right Boulevard. right in the middle of the neighborhood, right. uh, these two get shot to death. These right. two junkies. Shotgun, right. Uh, at a red light. Yeah. Woof. Yeah. Brutal. So 
uh, now all of these, now the feds are taking these murders and putting them in a RICO right. charge. So Dominic is arrested now for the murder of my brother-in-law and the murder of the Uvis, the mm -hmm. Pony and Clyde team. So he's indicted for that. Now I get sent for by a mob lawyer and he tells me some, one of you are getting indicted with Dominic. It's either John Jr., Ronnie one or you. We don't know which one it is. Wow. But I'm always, always lucky that way. And yeah. it was me. So, I, so now I went home and I gave my wife the card to an attorney. And I said, keep this card on you at all times. Yeah. And if, God forbid, if it's me and I call you and I'm arrested, call this lawyer. He'll know what to do. So I went to see the lawyer, another lawyer. Um, and I told him what was going on and, and I retained him. Mm -hmm. And I said, in case I get pinched. Yeah. You know, my wife will call you and bop, 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 bop. Mm -hmm. So I had everything set up already just in case it was me, which right. it was me. Right. So I get arrested. I get out on bail. I got the ankle monitor on. What I'm was on, your bail? Uh, it was my, it was like, three, it was 3 million. My father-in-law put up his company. Uh -huh. My mother put up her house. My cousin Ricky put up his house. My friend Donna put up her house. It was 3 million in, uh, you know, Assets. Yeah. It was in assets. So uh so I reached the three million mark and I got out. And uh while I'm out, now I'm I'm working. I'm I was driving a truck. Mm -hmm. I had no money. You know, yeah. now now the only um, I can't pay my bills. My wife's working for her father, you know, she's paying all the bills. Yeah. I can't I lost my job. I couldn't leave the house. Yeah. Um things aren't going good, you know, nobody's looking out for me, you know. Um Nikki's not helping me. Nobody's, you know, like I, I'm like, you know, um, on my own, basically. Right. Now I committed murders with these people, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and I don't know. I just, it was sort of like with the drugs, I sort of like was hitting the bottom with that lifestyle, you know, like I'm going, oh my, you know, what the, back to, you know, I just got home. I wasn't even home a year when I got, mm -hmm. I was home maybe a year when I got, I just did eight years and three months. Yeah. Now I'm indicted again. So what happened was, I got to back up a minute because now when I first got arrested, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in MDC in Brooklyn. Now I get a visit from this mob lawyer, Joe Carraza. He's the head lawyer on the case. And I'm willing to cop out already. Like I, I want to plead guilty. Like I want to get 10 years. Like, so I sit, I tell him, listen, if I could get 10 years right now, I'll plead guilty. Mm. Because we're not pleading guilty. We're going to trial. And now it started me thinking like, what do these guys want to throw me under the bus? Because I, I was the last person with this individual right so now i get out and i'm getting bad feelings i'm disillusioned now with the life i'm facing life in prison but i what, can't what was a plea deal an option no it was no okay. option i i didn't even couldn't even talk about it. they wouldn't even allow me to talk about it. like the, the the mob they wouldn't even allow me to bring it up like i couldn't even discuss it on my own or i was they they didn't want to hear it they wanted to go to trial so now I need money for lawyers. I have no money for lawyers. I'm getting disillusioned with this life. But I can't cooperate. Like, I just can't do it. I, you know, like, I want to, but I, I just can't. I'm guilt ridden. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to jail anymore. I just was like, I hit a bottom, like, just with the drugs. Like, I just woke up one day and I just didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I had a card from an FBI agent. This guy, Jerry Conrad, who just passed away not long ago. And I would pick up the phone and I'd hang it up. I'd pick up, and every time I picked it up, I would see my father's face. I couldn't, because I, he hated cooperators and I'd hang it up. And I'd pick, this went on for a year. I just couldn't do it. And then certain, I, then I saw certain moves by my co-defendants being made by Dom. Like, like we had a, 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 we had a meeting with our attorneys because I was allowed to go out to meet co-defendant meetings. So we're in the, this attorney's office and, um, he looks at me and he goes, when, when did your brother-in-law disappear? What week was it? And I look at him like, and I tell him the week and he goes, I knew it. That's the week I was in Florida. And I'm looking at him and like the lawyers and I, and I'm looking at him. He goes, that's the week I was in Florida. Mm. I'll have the travel agent produce the papers. So now we walk out and it's just him and I, and I go, Oh, what the fuck are you doing? What's going on? What are you talking about? He goes, I got a guy in the travel agent. He's going to give me paperwork with the saying that I was in Florida that week. 
So I says, well, what about me? What the fuck? Let him tell him. Mm -hmm. He goes, oh, I can't. Uh, no, I, I just, you know, it's only for me. I, you, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. So now he's already planning a friggin- to, to put it off on you. So now, but I still can't cooperate. I still can't do it. You know, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to make the call. Then I meet a guy, a friend of mine, a knock around guy that took a real chance, right? I'm in his house because now I had, we had time frames. You could go from point A to point B. So right. I added a little, so I'm by his house in Ozone Park. I don't want to say his name because he's still out there. And I'm um, in Ozone Park and I'm in his house and we drink a coffee and he tells me, what do you want? Why don't you call the government? I was in shock. I looked and I go, what the fuck are you talking about? Now this guy put his life on the line because I could have said, what are you, right? What are you kidding me? I'll mm -hmm. fucking kill you. How could you talk? And I says, what are you talking about? How could I do that? I said, what are you crazy? I said, how could you even tell me that? I can't, can't disrespect my father like that. Mm -hmm. He goes, disrespect your father. You killed somebody with your father. You did everything your father ever asked you to do. What are you, not save yourself? Mm -hmm. You're going to go to jail for these people? I still couldn't do it. So now I, I leave his house. I'm not, I'm, I'm even a little annoyed at him at that point for mm -hmm. even like saying this to me. And I go home and I had some legal issue going. So there's um, a time, with, so they, a RICO has to be predicate acts. But the federal government could, like I did time for bookmaking. I took a plea mm -hmm. in New York State for bookmaking and went to jail. The feds could still use that crime, even though I paid my debt to society. They used the crime I already did a bid for. I did two years. They used that crime that I already pled guilty to in the state court to put in the federal RICO right. for a predicate. So to, to move your points up. Right. To so get there's you more a time, time frame where that they have a certain amount of time to use that predicate act because I already pled guilty to and I felt that they violated that time frame. Right. So I retain a lawyer. I don't want to say the name of the lawyer. I retain a lawyer to look into this. Mm -hmm. But the lawyer needs help, paperwork, and help from my co-defendant, Dominic's attorney. Right. Who you don't trust now. Right. Because you I know, think you're right. in cahoots. Now, He's in cahoots with them to throw the you under the bus. Now the lawyer that's doing this for me calls me up and says to me, now this lawyer knew me, loved me, liked me, liked my father, was good friends with us calls me up and says, listen, these people are going to throw you under the bus. You need to call the government. And this person put their whole career on the line because mob guys don't use lawyers that work with cooperators. Right. They, don't, they, they won't hire them. Right. They won't retain them. And it, that's a big chunk of their income. income right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The lawyer tells me, you need to call the government. These people are going to throw you under the bus. They told me that they're not going to give me the information I want because they're going to bring it up at trial. And if you use it in a motion, they can't use it at the trial. But at the trial, it doesn't help me. Right. So they tell me, you need to call the government. I, I hang up the phone. I go to, I, I'm, I hang up the phone. I sit on my couch. I'm thinking about it. I go to sleep. The next morning I wake up. Can't do it. I take the card. I couldn't call on my own. I take the card. I give it to my wife and I go, listen, when you go to work today, she worked in Ridgewood, Queens. We lived in mm -hmm. Comac, Long Island. I said, when you go to work today, call this number and tell this guy to come see me. So she took the card. I couldn't call myself. I couldn't do it. She took the card. She went to work. She made the call. And that afternoon, two FBI agents came to see me and I, and I, profit, and I cooperated. Mm -hmm. And and you told them, I mean, did you tell them everything? Well, the first question they asked me was, did you kill your brother-in-law? Yeah. That's the first question. They, they sat down in my dining room, and the first question out of their mouths was, did you murder your brother-in-law? And I said, yes. But did you say, well, I didn't pull the trigger? No. At that point, I said, yes. And then they asked me how it, how it went down, and then I told them how it went down. And they said, all right. They took out a list of, of, uh, of 10 attorneys. 
Mm -hmm. I had to get re legal representation then. I took out a list. They looked, took out a list of 10 attorneys and I knew one of them. Mm -hmm. I knew of one of them on the list, this guy, Michael Gold. His father used to be a DA, my, a Eugene Gold. He was the Brooklyn DA who locked up my father many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I recognized his name and I knew him because he worked out of my other attorney, John Pollock's office, which was one of John Gotti's lawyers. And I, and I, and I, and uh, um, I, I called and I picked his, they, I took his name and number. Um, the next day that they asked me how much I need, they need, tell me you need money. I said, yeah, I need money for my, I'm behind in my mortgage. I needed to like, like 2,500 to catch up on my bills. Mm -hmm. The next day the agents came back, they gave me like 3,500 in cash mm -hmm. to pay my bills and everything. And then I met with this attorney, Michael Gold. I retained him. So the, the deal was, I had no money to pay him. The deal was that we knew we had to sell. I owned the townhouse in Comac with my wife. We knew we had to sell the townhouse. So at the closing, he would take his fee out of the closing money. So he was guaranteed to get mm -hmm. paid. And I signed papers and all that. So he represented me. And then I met with, they rented a suite at the Waldorf Astoria. And I met there with like, I don't know. A whole, oh, it was it was a a suite full of U.S. attorneys mm -hmm. and FBI agents, and they just I was there all day. They were just asking me question after question about murders. And are you with your lawyer at the time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Always with my lawyer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, and then I, and then um, I wasn't in taken off the street yet. I was still meeting. I was still so now I'm cooperating and I'm going to like meeting still meeting with Dominic. I'm not wearing a wire or nothing right, or anything right. like that. And they're following me around and I, I stood home about a month and then they took me off the street. Okay. And they put you in witness protection? Yeah, first I had to go to court and plead guilty to the murder. Uh -huh. They took me to court. It's funny because I went to court and I was in front of this Judge Weinstein and so I'm in I'm in I'm in I'm in the court and uh I had to make a statement about explain to them about the murder and who was with me. And uh, so I I I'm so before I did that, he asks me, he looks down at me and he asks me, so how long have you been an associate of the Gambino family? So I looked up at him and I said, since birth. Mm. He thought I was joking. He goes, what? You know, like he like he got like a little annoyed. He goes, What do you mean since birth? And my lawyer like clinked it up. My lawyer jumped in and goes, Yeah, you're on a because the year he was born, his father became a made member of the mafia and blah, 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 blah. And the judge said, oh, okay, now I understand. Um, and then I had to just explain to the judge about plead guilty to the murder who was with me. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I pled guilty to the murder. Did you know, did you have an agreement before you pled out that you were going to get, you know, you couldn't get over a certain no, amount of time? I had no, no, because you have to sign, when you sign a cooperation agreement is you you, so you're taking a big risk. Yeah, you yeah, and this is what how they this is how they do it. So now you sign a contract, to a cooperation agreement, mm. and in that agreement it says if you get caught in any lie, or wow. you give misinformation, you'll get the whatever the sentence requires. You're going to get the maximum amount of time. So they make you plead guilty, right. but you're not sentenced. You're pleading yeah. guilty to a murder, so you could get zero to life. Right. So you could end up ratting on everybody and still getting life. Yeah, if you- Potentially. Right, if, you, uh, if you up a oof. lie, right. Were you nervous? Like, were you like- Well, I wasn't nervous at that point because there was no reason for me to lie. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, 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 when I made the decision to cooperate, it was like, I, I, if I was going to lie or I was going to go into this program and still be a criminal and still do stupid, yeah. I went into done. Right. Like I was done. Like there was yeah. no reason for me to lie no more. I didn't need to make anything up. They already knew. First of all, they knew everything anyway. Yeah. They just needed someone to cooperate. They knew everything anyway, the, mm -hmm. the feds. Like they told me, I forgot, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So- uh, And that's where you found out a lot, a lot of your dad's murders. Yeah. And my brother-in-law, they told me, we never realized how many murders your brother-in-law was in on until Peter Sakara started cooperating because they were partners. Right. Yeah. So before you actually killed your brother-in-law, he had a lot of bodies yes, on, on yes, his own. Yes, yes, Him and his partner, Peter yeah. Chicago, they were they're dangerous. So what did, did they, and did they want to know about your whole criminal history? Everything, did everything. they want to know about, did you have to tell them about other yeah, I had open to tell investigations? Them about, I had to tell them about every crime I committed, every crime I committed with some people, every crime other people committed that I knew of. Mm. They really wanted to know about murders, murders, which I knew a lot of, about murders. They want to know about co corrupt cops. 
Uh, um, did you give him corrupt cops? I didn't really know anything. I knew I knew of corrupt cops, but I never paid them off. Uh, they wanted me to give them murders, which I did. They, you know, I gave them uh, murders with uh, the Shamrock murders. Uh, uh, Ch Charlie Carnegie murdered my friend Michael. I gave them, you know, I testified at six trials. Oh, wow. I testified at six trials, a lot of murders. This other guy, Johnny Burke, he committed a few murders. I testified at his trial. Uh, where were you held while these, in this process, where did they stash you? Like after you pled yeah. guilty. So when I first pled guilty, they took me to a, a safe house in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Oh. It, was in, it was very cold. I was on the ocean in the winter. Yeah. So I couldn't, but uh, they took me there first. My wife and my daughter were still in Comac, and my son was in, in Howard Beach. Mm -hmm. And then from, from Point Pleasant, I went to uh, Pennsylvania to the Poconos. They put me in a safe house in the Poconos. Mm -hmm. While I was in that safe house, they moved my wife and my daughter to Michigan. Okay. And then they took me and I, they put me in Michigan. I went to Michigan. Mm -hmm. When I was in Michigan, I finally, I went into the, that's when I got interviewed by the marshals and I got accepted in the witness protection program because I needed to change my name. Mm -hmm. And I went into the witness protection program alone. Uh -huh. They took me from my house in Michigan to a secure location in DC. From there, they sent me to Idaho. That was a trip. <laughs> yeah, so that, right. <laughs> with my accent living in Idaho. Yeah, right. So now I'm living in Idaho. I loved it, but I was in this town called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I've was, been there. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Right? Beautiful. Yeah. The mountain lake. I totally. lived right there. Beautiful. So I was living in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah, a lot of people from California go there on vacation. For sure. Right? Yeah. And I'm hanging out there. I made some good friends there. I started dating an Apache Indian. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, that I met at an AA meeting because I go to 12 step. Now I'm clean a lot here, so I go to meetings, you know? Um, I'm making this AA meetings out there because I go to Narcotics Anonymous, but there was none in this town. I was in Coeur d'Alene. So I'm, I'm, I'm making meetings. I'm doing really good. I'm, I'm you know, that. I'm, Are you working or no, did they no, just give no, you a pension? Me, they pay so your what rent. They did was the witness protection program, people talk bad about it, but I had a great experience in there. I mean, as soon as I got there, they bought me a car for 15000 cash. They bought me a Jeep, taxpayer money. Yeah. They bought me a Jeep Liberty. They got me new glasses. I got. I had to get, I had, was having trouble with my bridge. I had to get a new bridge. That cost 10000 They got me a new bridge. I had health insurance. I had a beautiful apartment that they paid for. Yeah. And they would give me, and they gave me 1200 a month for my pocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they were actually took care of you. Took care of everything, and the guy loved me because I had never gave him. Any, he just told me I was the best guy on his caseload. Yeah, because I never gave him any problems. I, you mm -hmm. know, I didn't have any bad habits. I was yeah. low key. So bring us to the trial of Frankie's Frankie's murder. Now it's the only now that you're cooperating, yeah. it's essentially just you and the government versus Dominic. Well, Skinny Dominic, Dom. Do, the, 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 the funny thing is Dominic. Didn't get found guilty for the murder. He got found guilty for everything else but the murder of my brother-in-law. Even though you testified against him? Yep. How, and he was the trigger man. How did they find him not guilty? I have no it's idea. It's a federal to trial. He got convicted of everything. He went to jail for 12 years for everything but the murder of the FBI were like up in arms. But he didn't get convicted. It was just, I don't know what happened. The jury, juries are crazy. You know, I testified at six trials, five, everybody got convicted of, I mean, five Guilties and the only trial that every the guy beat all the charges were uh, Vinnie Asaro on the Lutunza case. He got found not guilty. That's and that was I remember reading about that guy. He was an old man yeah. and they're perp walking him. I remember seeing yeah, in the yeah. news they're walking this sad old man. Yeah, yeah, he ain't that sad. That was all an act. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. But I felt bad for him because yeah, I'm like that's and the jury felt bad for him too. That's why they let him go. He was a cold blooded murderer. I know. I yeah. probably would have voted yeah. not guilty yeah, just but, because uh, if you get away with that so one. So for some reason, so anyway, Domin and then uh, I testified at uh, at Char Charlie Caniglia's trial. He was a serial killer. He was the guy that dissolved the guy that killed uh, John Gotti's son that ran over John Gotti's son. Uh, right. He was the guy that dissolved the body. Um, he got convicted for murders. He he murdered a few people. He, I testified at that trial. So he's doing life. He's doing life. Then I testified at this guy Johnny Burke's trial. He was he killed a few people with Johnny A. Light. Uh -huh. He got convicted of murder. He got life. I testified at um, this guy Bobby Glasses' his trial. He Shamrock murders. They killed two innocent people in a bar. In a bar, he got convicted for the murders. He got life. And then I testified at this guy Cyril Perone's trial. 
He was a captain in the Genovese family. He got convicted not for any any violence. He got convicted. He got a couple of years. So, but but what is so fascinating is that the feds that have a ninety nine percent conviction rate at trial, here you are in, in the, testifying somebody that was involved in this murder, fingering on the stand the trigger man, Skinny Dom, and. They find him not guilty. Not only was I testified, one of the people that were on the boat, yeah, Tommy Flash, my friend Tommy Flash, he was one of the guys that disposed of his body. He testified. Wow. And Dominic was on the boat with them. So right. Dominic shot him and went on the boat the next day. Right. And the jury still found him guilty of everything but that one particular murder. Wow. So what else, what did they find him guilty of? Uh, gambling, conspiracy. But see, this is what happened. The judge, Weinstein, knew he married my brother-in-law. Yeah. So he got a big sentence regardless. He still got 18 years because the judge knew mm -hmm. he committed that murder. And he didn't get convicted for the Uber, Uber murders either. Wow. And, and bosses testified, but the judge knew. See, the federal courts are, are different than, yeah. than state courts. Even though... The jury says not guilty. The judge has the discretion to use them crimes against you anyway. In sentencing. Right. Yeah. In sentencing. And that's what this judge did. So he got convicted for only bookmaking. Right. Right? But the judge gave him above the guidelines. Yeah. Gave him 18 years. The judge gave him the most he could give him above the... So the bookmaking guidelines... The judge went above and beyond yeah, right. the guidelines because of the murders, even though he got found not guilty of the murders. If this judge could have gave him life, he would have gave him life anyway. Of course. Because the judge knew the deal. Because the judge knew the deal from when I pled guilty on my own. Mm -hmm. Like, the, they knew I was telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And the judge knew it. The jury, I don't know what the f they were thinking. Where I, was the trial? It was in Brooklyn. Were there Italians on the jury? It was, you know what? It's funny you said that because when the jury got paneled, the lead agent, the case agent, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry Conrad, he didn't like the jury from day one. There was a lot of young guys in the jury. Like, I don't, you know, like, listen, there was one guy, kid in there had one of them stupid things in their ear, you know, them big gauges. Yeah. Gauges in his ear, you know, like just like, you could just look at them and like, mm -hmm. and, and they, they, and they came back with questions about where, where's the forensics evidence. Yeah. Like, you know, because they watch see they watch these right. stupid TV shows. But also, yeah, people are sick of it. Yeah, people are yeah. sick of the overreach of the federal government. Yeah. Just yeah. because you got four criminals, yeah. like like Sammy the Bull, he might be a great guy. He might be your friend. Yeah. But why does he get to kill nineteen people? And then all he's got to do is say, "Yeah, he did it," and that's because enough proof. That's what the government. That's that's. What but the I'm saying, does. so people, young people that are getting on the jury now I, have had it, I and agree. they're like, "There's no forensic evidence. There's no physical evidence. This was 20 years ago. How about you?" Yeah, no, it, it's definitely. like voting for Donald but Trump. We don't is, agree with yeah, him, but, but this is, it's this, a finger this, to the this system. Is, this is this is where it comes in. Where the plea agreement comes in. If the if I lied. The feds knew I lied. I get life. Yeah. So now if I say you, Johnny, killed him mm -hmm. and I'm lying, I'm going to get life. Right. But the jury still but probably the, looks at you as a criminal right. and it's doing whatever you can. And the jury's not believing in the plea because the plea agreement is read to the jury. They know about the plea agreement. Right. Like the government makes sure they know about the plea agreement. Right. And you're right. People that murder people shouldn't get, you know, we got to get out of jail card free. Yeah. Like a monopoly. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, it's not fair, but that's, that's the government. That's what I they mean, do. you know, and, and I'm just, yeah, a guy like skinny Dom, sh you shouldn't be on the streets, but the government doesn't play fair either. Of so course not. I, I don't know where and, to like, no, then you're right. Listen, they have all the, that's why they're the mafia. Yeah. The government, my father said that. Your dad mafia. was right. Your dad was right. Listen, you're hundred percent right. Sammy killed 19 people. He's free. I killed my bro. I'm free. Yeah. I got no time. I got time served, but you know what? The judge Weinstein, if you, I don't know if, if you ever could read it, read it. When I finally did get sentenced, when I finally really did get, when I, when my sentencing day came in 2014, I got sentenced, right? Um, I could, I didn't know what I was going to get. 
you know, I could have went to jail. I couldn't got, you know, like I, 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 now I'm free a lot of years. I'm free. I'm free nine years. I'm, I'm testifying right. at trials. Right. Now the judge says it's time for me to get sentenced. The government didn't want me to get sentenced yet. The government <laughs> didn't want me to get sentenced till after I was done testifying. Right. Because they still had cases pending. But the judge said, they put a motion for the judge not to sentence me yet. Uh, but he said, no, I want to get, now mm -hmm. I thought right away, maybe this guy's going to put me in jail, right? So they were worried, the government, because they didn't want me in jail. So now it comes the day of my sentencing. I go to New York, I fly to New York, and they have a victim impact statement. Mm -hmm. So my bro and Frankie's sister takes the stand and I should get life. You know, they killed my brother, my niece, Takes this down. My niece wasn't was a baby when, we, right. when she Frankie's takes, daughter. Right. My niece. She takes this. Goes up there. She says to the judge that I should get life. Right. Mm -hmm. Now the judge sentences me, and he makes a statement, and he tells the family, the victims. Right. He says, he looks at me, and he goes, "This man didn't murder. This man's not to blame for this murder." The mafia is to blame for this murder. He mm -hmm. was in, I was, I was from birth. Yeah. And he makes this very like speech like about how the mafia, you know, created this person. And if he puts me in jail, I'm a tool now to bring this mafia to an end. So things mm -hmm. like this don't happen. And he was very artistic. Uh, Artic articulate. Uh, articulate in how he worded it. And he gave me no time. Yeah. He gave me five years supervised release. Yeah. I think that's fair. You know, I mean. I'm sure they, you know, were obviously furious and devastated. Yeah, of course they were. You know, but but I mean. Does your niece know who her father really was, though? No. My niece, well, she never, she don't remember him. No, she doesn't but know. But does she hear I mean, stories about what yeah, a murdering scumbag No, because scumbag my, he was? my sister, no. They, they don't, you know, we don't talk to her about him. I yeah. mean, you know, I. I you know, I feel terrible for her. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel terrible. For, I even feel bad talking about it. But, you know, it's something that I have to talk about, you know. Um, have you have you res, uh, made a resolution with them at all? Well, I, you I mean, I speak to my sister. I, I you know, I, I, when, when, so when, when I decided to cooperate, I told the feds, I, I'm not going to, you have to take me to see my mother and my sister because I wanted to give them closure. Mm -hmm. So I went, they took me to my, the day I left to go to, uh, Point Pleasant, they took me to my mother's house. So my sister was outside. So I told, I hugged her and I told her and she started screaming at me, how could you do that? How could mm -hmm. you do that? And she ran away. Um, and I went upstairs to my mother's house and I, my mother's in the kitchen and I told my mother, you know, and my mother, she just like looked at me and she looked at me and she went to me, she shook her head and she went, I, I can't believe he made you do things like that. She told me. She understood. Yeah, she goes, I can't believe that he made you do things like that. Like my father made me do stuff like that. She goes, I don't know how he could do that. I don't know why, how he could make you do things like that. Wow. She really got it. Yeah. Even, you know, she was so loyal to your father, loved him yeah. till the day he died, but she knew that he really groomed you to yeah. kind of be a killer or yeah. enabled you. Yeah. Yeah, well. that's what she said. She goes, I can't believe he made you do things like that. I can't believe it either, but you know, yeah, you know, that's what happened, you know, yeah. and, and then I left and then I left. I mean, I didn't speak to my sister for a lot of years. We talk now, but you know, listen, yeah. I, I did a horrible thing, you know, I, you know, and I, I wish I could go back and, mm -hmm. you know, not do it, but it's done. You know, what am I going to do? You know, like, and, and, you know, it's funny because when we did it, I didn't even give a shit. Like I didn't even fucking phase me, you mm -hmm. know, back then, like yeah. my, 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 my thinking process and was so non-existent back then like i was so wrapped up in that life yeah. like it was just didn't even bother me like it was business yeah business like, as usual you know like i i went you know i drove around with this poor kid's father looking for him yeah. when i knew that, that you know he's gone yeah you know it just didn't fit like i went out you know when i think of it like i went out with dinner with guys that i knew they were going to die that weekend like mm -hmm. we had dinner and laughed and joked and i knew like yeah that was it like yeah you know, it's just a crazy lifestyle. Yeah. And I think that's what people are. I think that's why with all this stuff going on now on the YouTube and the shows, it's just so unique. Like people that live that life, it's a unique lifestyle yeah. and it interests, perks people's interest. For sure. Because, you know, not everybody could live that way. No, it's a subculture that's rapidly going away. So I mm -hmm. think guys like you 
uh, it's good that you are able to share this with everybody mm. before it's gone, before it's mm. extinct. Mm. Uh, so we really appreciate you coming on here. Uh, you stick around. Let's do like a half an hour on Patreon because there's some questions that right. I want right. to ask you, some follow up <laughs> questions. All right. But go Reform Gangsters yes, is reformgangsters.com, my YouTube. Uh, subscribe. That's and right. Become a Patreon member. That's right. And what do you do on there? You're doing mob well, history. I'm doing mob history, my life history. I'm doing recovery stuff. I'm having a guest on. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of stuff. I, I put out a free video every Friday. Yeah. Um, I put it out on Patreon. You could become a member or on Friday, just become a subscriber yeah. to my YouTube channel. I put put it out. And I talk about my life. I talk about stories. I talk about things I did, things other people did. I go live every once in a yeah. while. I, I talk a lot about recovery. You know, tomorrow, January 12th, I'll be personally clean and sober 35 years. Tomorrow is my, my sobriety date. So that's a big accomplishment. So I'll, I talk about that. Um and you know, I sell some merchandise on there. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. yeah, and it's. I checked out a couple of videos. It's very good content. Thank you. The guests are fascinating, obviously. Yes. Uh, so go over there, and then of course watch Get Gotti. Without a doubt. I mean, you're just so handsome on there, and <laughs> your teeth you. are shiny yeah. white, and yeah. it's just yeah. They you, did good lighting. There. They had good lighting. You killed yeah. it. Yeah. It was thank it was you. tremendous. Thank so you. thank you for schlepping all the way out here My from pleasure. Florida. I love LA. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, we'll see you over on Patreon. Anthony Ruggiano Jr. Thank, thank you, you so much, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.